long days, pleasant nights, and welcome to Kingslingers, a doof media podcast journeying through Stephen King's Dark Tower series and beyond. I am your host, Costa Reader Scott Daly, and joining me as always, you'll find him down in a Mexican market dickering over tomatoes. It's Mr. Matt Freeman. How's it going, Matt? Hey, everybody. Ready? Oh, oh, oh God. Oh, no. Ah. Oh, no. <laughs> it was so senseless. I guess I'll just have to do the podcast by myself. What a tragic and depressing ending to the <laughs> Kingslinkers podcast. <laughs> this week on the show, our eight-part series covering Stephen King's Duma Key continues with part seven. We'll be chatting about chapters 18 all the way through the end of the novel. After some clutch ventriloquism, the boys manage to find the Percy China doll and drown it inside a flashlight tube, which they proceed to then also drown in one of Minnesota's 1,000 lakes. Edgar then starts his third life down in Mexico with his friend Wireman, and they live happily ever <laughs> after. <laughs> Except when Wireman dies. Yeah, no, no. I like I like your ending better, Scott. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna remember this book that way. <laughs> Matt, what did you think about this week's reading? Um, gosh, what did I think about this week's reading? Like, it, here's the thing. This is one of those King books. That is unquestionably a great book, but it left me just feeling sad. And I don't know, like maybe it's pushing some specific buttons with me, but I, I've i normally King gives you a little something to pick you up at the end. Like even if, even if there's a tragedy in the story, it's like, you know, but at least they had their, you know, their sweetheart or um their family or their found family or something this was just like edgar's alone in mexico <laughs> everybody hates him and his daughter's dead and wireman's dead and elizabeth's dead jack's alive i guess <laughs> I, 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 it got to me, man. Like I'm, mm, mm-hmm. I'm being, I'm being humorous here, but also like this is a, this is like a heavy book. I was not really expecting this. It, I, I maybe I should have been. It's a gothic tale. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm not. You know, we'll go into the. We'll, we'll get through it, obviously. But um, that's you asked me how what did I think of this week's reading. That's my emotional, uh, uh unpacking the backpack and handing you its contents. Right yeah, there. I mean, I think this is one of those things, you know, you and I are so similar in a lot of ways, at least at least in how we l- like media and approach media. I think this is one of those ways in which you and I are just fundamentally different in that, like, I don't disagree with anything you just said, but man, I fucking love it. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. I, I really do. It's so funny because um, I was just listening to a podcast today when I was on my walk uh, talking about the movie Manchester by the Sea, which I know is a film that you haven't seen but it is, without spoiling anything, one of the saddest, most depressing, horrifying things you've ever watched in your entire life. Um, and I love that movie. I absolutely love that movie. And like, I like, like, I, it, it's just a sad story. It is it, just such an incredibly sad story. This this book is. Um, but I just, I, I was, I was absolutely blown away by it. Like, you know, we, we've. We've talked about this at the very beginning and about how shocked I was that as many people like this book as they do, um, because I always feel like it was this this unsung uh, Stephen King novel. And just like this, this read has cemented it for me as just like probably maybe in my top five. I haven't thought that through, Um, but I I loved this this book and I, I loved the way it ended. I loved the the almost almost meaningless cruelty of some of it. Um, yeah. And and per- and perhaps what that final message is, which I'm sure we'll get to. But I don't know. I don't know. It's it's like I, I agree with feeling all the way all the ways that you felt. Um, but I I loved feeling that way. I think maybe I'm a little too stung by it in the moment to say that it's in my top five or any sentiment like that specifically. But I mean, mm-hmm. it wouldn't have made me so upset if it hadn't been working on me really well. And I right. I I do value. I mean, art that affects me is in some regards my favorite art. But but it but I can't deny that in this moment I'm almost like mad. I, but, but it's it's complicated, right? And I, yeah. I think that's the sign of good art, though, is something that makes you upset, um, which this did do actually. So it'll be interesting as we go through it. 
to t- maybe talk about what King is doing with this book. Cause I just, I feel yeah. like tonally the ending, n- not that he repeats himself because we've talked a lot about how he, he's always kind of changing things up and always kind of doing different things. But I do feel like there's a certain tone that he likes to leave you with. Mm-hmm. And this tone, he just, this book, he just throws that out the window and it's just a, such a different, such a different tone. Um, yeah. I mean, we have talked about how King is, is, is often a softy, right? And even if he has terrible, terrible things that happen over the course of a story, he does like to leave you on a positive note. Like, um, and yeah, that is, that is not this book. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess you could argue maybe like if you try, if you really try to look through and find the silver lining, you can, you can look at Edgar, uh, you know, perhaps being a person that is trying to find that third life, that, that new chance, that new opportunity. Um, you know, I think back to the line he's, he has is, is that like, he's not quite given up yet. I think the the thing he says is, you know, I hope to have many more happy moments in my life from here on out or else what would be the point of living? Uh, but I haven't, I haven't felt one, uh, since this, this last one, uh, when his gallery show was about to start. So yeah, I don't think he's quite given up yet on that. And I think he's taking Wyman's words to heart, but, but yeah, um, yeah, it's certainly it's certainly a depressing ending. Well, maybe we can explore some of these things because I don't fully disagree, at, at, and I don't think I disagree at all. I mean, I think it's a story about human resiliency mm-hmm. in the face of like genuinely horrible shit. Like it's yeah. easy, it, it, it it's cheap to write a story about human resili- resiliency if you haven't really gone through much, right? Sure. But this guy has has just been stepped on and stepped on and stepped on. And then the book ends and just before the ending, he gets stepped on one final time for good measure. And and you're like, Oh my God. And, but, but it's, but it's about like the human spirit and our capacity to not like bounce back, but, but, but survive, right. To, to endure. Mm -hmm. Um, And that, I don't know if that's a silver lining. That's some kind of, it's like a light gray lining, let's call it. Um, (laughs) It's, it's yeah. interesting. It's very interesting it, what he's trying to do with the book, though. It is, and I think the the choice of of Wireman's death at the end, I think, is something <clears throat> that we should spend quite a bit of time on because it is the one that feels so apart and independent from everything else that happens in the book. Right, the the story's over. It's not a plot beat, really. It's just a thing that happens right before you turn to the final page, um, and and that makes it interesting. And, and I think we should dive into perhaps what he was going for there, what he was trying to do with that beat in particular, mixed in with everything else that happens in this climax. Yeah, well, let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. All right, let's just jump right into it. Chapter 18, titled Novine. Uh, we start this chapter with the trio entering what remains of the original Heron's Roost. Edgar is expressing his doubt about being able to find some of some of Elizabeth's drawings intact. And we get this quote from Wireman, Matt. It says, you could be right. But I don't trust you, Wireman said, because, muchacho, you're in mourning, and that makes a man tired. You're listening to the voice of experience. So I think this, Matt, is is a great place to introduce the concept that our characters mentioned several times throughout the course of this this finale of the, the book, that there is some sort of force for good looking out for them. We'll call it, I don't know, just this, uh, pulling some name out of a thin air, uh, the white. Um, uh uh-huh. This this isn't anything our characters have talked about until until this point in the novel until the very end. Um, but I wanted it. I wanted it to like. I wanted us to use this as a jumping off point of, of this quote right here to kind of talk about this concept because we asked the question a few weeks ago, or, or well, I guess technically Wireman asked asked it to Edgar. Did did Percy draw you, Wireman, down here like like she drew me, Edgar, down here? And remember when Wireman asked the question, like, why am I not trying to paint or draw or do anything artistic down here? That doesn't make a lot of sense. And 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 so I guess the the thing I have for you is let me pose the reason Wireman is down here is not because of Percy, but is actually because of the white. You know, that quote I just read is what, in my opinion, truly unlocked it for me, because we, we've talked about before throughout the course of this whole thing, the similarities between Edgar, Elizabeth, and Wireman, you know, that concept of head trauma, contra coup, 
Uh, but we failed to really highlight the, the new comparison that has now been created between Edgar and Weirman, which is they have both had the unfortunate experience of losing a child. And so pretend you're the white, right? Um, an, another great evil has ascended and its presence angers you just like it did in desperation. So you send a Katet down to help deal with it. And one of the men you send is one that can acutely understand exactly what it is that Edgar is is being forced to go through and back him up with needed and be that support for him when needed. That just seems to make perfect sense to me. It does. Although this is yet again, one of those occasions where the, it, it does sort of bother me and make me not entirely comfortable with the nature of the white, because um, the white must have known that Edgar was going to lose his daughter mm-hmm. in advance <laughs> in order, <laughs> in order to do that. I mean, I disagree though. It's, it's, um, it's an expression of King's philosophy. It's a very yeah. sort of maximally dark expression of King's philosophy. It's the, the, the shared experience of losing a child. It does create this strength of uh, the, the source of strength and this bond that allows our characters to soldier on and, and to do what needs to be done. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's such a, I don't know, it's such a depressing, um, situation i guess I, I don't know it yeah. just makes me feel bad <laughs> okay I mean, one, one of the things we've always examined throughout the course of this whole project is like when the white decides to intervene directly in the story and when it does not right um and and those moments are always really interesting and, and here is i think as you said a perfect example of it the white is not going to prevent edgar's daughter from dying <laughs> no 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 we're not going to do that um, but, but we are going to equip Edgar with the perfect person to help him through that, <laughs> which is, which is, you just kind of scratch your head and go like, but why that way? Why did you do like, we're, we're going to make sure that, you know, that, that we're going to pump this, this intuition into Wireman at the very end to pull out his gun. So the Heron doesn't attack him and kill him as he opens the door to the, the shed. Uh, but we're not going to equip him to, to stop any of the deaths that happen. Um, throughout the other like it, it is just so interesting the ways in which this presence has forced this this kind of ultimate power in this universe uh, flexes itself and and the moments that it doesn't i think i would be more frustrated if we hadn't just talked about desperation honestly because because <laughs> i think desperation made it i don't know i think clear might be too strong a word but made made the case that basically like oh so you you would just prefer that the white just solve everyone's problems all the time. <laughs> yeah. That would just take away everyone's free will. Like we, we would have, we would have no problems and also we would have nothing ever because taking away everyone's problems by necessity takes away our freedom of, of choice and yeah. really removes anything interesting from the world. And so in order for there to continue to be a, a sort of dynamic life that we live, uh, there, there has to be the chance of, you know, there has to be danger. Um, yeah, that that I think was an argument that was articulated in des- desperation, which I I think I more or less bought within that book. And and I guess I'm just going to c- carry that idea forward to kind of help me think about King's philosophy here. It, it does strike me how much of <laughs> how much of these books are about God in in an abstract sense when mm-hmm. they're not in it in a specific sense. Right. Like e- even even when he's not specifically using the word God. <laughs> King is talking about trying to understand the mysteries of the universe and why certain things happen and certain things don't. And like, it, it just like ingrained through everything he writes, like the, the, the original inciting incident of this entire story is the, the accident that took Edgar's arm. And it's like, ultimately as a reflection of the accident that almost took his life, it's like, well, why do these things happen? Well, we don't know. Can we yeah. uh, uh, apply purpose to them? Uh, sometimes. Um, sometimes not. And, and, and I also like, like, I think one of the things that I do find the most interesting is, is I like, I, the argument I'm making here with, with, you know, the white being responsible for, uh, for Wireman's inclusion of the story is not that the white, like killed Wireman's child and wife. Um, although I, I suppose you could make that argument if you wanted to, but the argument I'm having is, is, oh, he saw a person who went through this thing and, and, uh, it decided it could use that to some greater purpose. And so I do like this idea of someone who has been through a horrific ordeal ha- has nearly died and is searching for the whys of it is finding himself. And I'm talking about King here in this instance, um, attracted to the idea that 
the, the, the world, the universe, life can find people who have been through these things and have use for them in some way. And, you know, mm-hmm. like, like as trying to, trying to like, I, I still have value. I still have use. And, and this thing that I experienced, uh, will, will, will help in some way that, yeah. that I can't perhaps myself quite see yet. Yeah. I mean, so I, I agree the way I would phrase it maybe is that, you know, it was the random that killed Wireman's, um, wife and daughter, but, and, 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 if if that was where it had ended, then that would have been a senseless, meaningless death. Mm-hmm. That as it is, what what the purpose does, what the white does, is it puts things to a purpose. You know, it it takes sure. takes things that were meaningless and it puts them to a purpose. And so that that horrible, senseless tragedy is given purpose. It's given meaning by Wireman being brought here and being able to be this rock, this friend for Edgar to rely on in this moment yeah. where he really needs it. Yeah, yeah. No, I like that. I like that. So yeah, complicated stuff. I'm not, and I, and I agree with you. I, I'm never quite sure how I feel about these these things. I mean, it is it is one truism that I think is through just about every single book, though, that we're eventually going to get a point where either either subtextually or textually, the book is going to be like, and there is some mystical, powerful force helping our heroes <laughs> do something. Right? It seems yeah. to just always happen. Yeah, it's true. It, uh, I mean, that's how he constructs his stories. It seems to be important to his idea of how storytelling should be right Mm -hmm. yep so the three learn from a spare piece of paper lying around that the table uh, that we've heard so much about is just like a a brand of whiskey keg that percy is most likely being stored in it's leaking mystery solved (laughs) huh so sometimes we try to build great metaphors from phrases and it turns out that the table is leaking was just elizabeth literally describing what's happening yeah but yeah well what have i got in my pocket is my favorite riddle for, the, for similar reasons <laughs> yeah, um yeah yeah no I, I don't feel too bad about not guessing this one because uh how the fuck would i have um no <laughs> yeah it, it's, it's good to know though yeah i mean, I, I like i was curious because i didn't i wouldn't even know for sure i was like is like table whiskey like a type of whiskey that we could have maybe guessed that but no it's just like the the brand <laughs> Uh-huh. Or, or like what, the, yeah, like it's just, there's a table whiskey. Uh, I've never sure. Heard of it. Sure. Yeah. Um, so as the two, as the three search the house, Wireman remembers that Elizabeth had a ha ha, a hidden compartment in the stairs that she hides some of her most important documents in. He assumes that this was learned behavior and that there might be one here in this house as well. And of course there is. And inside of it, we don't find Elizabeth's drawing. We don't find Percy, but we do find Matt, the little raggedy doll novi <laughs> love it <laughs> so let's talk about dolls a little bit here matt like an- another similarity between elizabeth and edgar are these dolls so the question is why why this motif what do you think well uh, this isn't going to be my most intellectual answer but i mean okay. dolls are creepy as hell um yep, true and something about dolls strikes me as being gothic although i don't know if i could put my finger on it i guess it's just you it wouldn't be out of place to see a creepy doll in a creepy gothic mansion setting. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, Watsonian wise, like within the story frame, it's interesting to consider like, why is the doll here? Like within the story, like not, not why did King put the doll here, but story wise, like, cause, yeah. because Percy, Percy does appear to possess Elizabeth um, at different times. You know, I, I, I think, right. It's never quite sure, but it's, it seems like it. Um, yeah. And I kind of always assumed that Percy was possessing uh, the doll and that we were hearing Percy's voice coming from the doll. I, I thought I, I thought that was what was going on. But That's like, how it was described in the How to Draw Picture sections. Yeah, that, that, he, that originally Novine was talking to her and then it changed voices over time until it was just Percy. Yeah. 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 So, I, so I don't think I was wrong there. But like so but this is clearly not. This is clearly not Percy, right? I mean, no, this is no. something else. It's yeah. unclear who, whose voice this is exactly. Yeah, to me, yeah, anyway. no, definitely. We'll, we'll get yeah. into that for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think it is interesting that, like, I agree with you. In our our constant refrain for this entire book has been, "Oh, so gothic," and I, and I do agree with you that, like, just including creepy dolls in your story is is, is I think a, a way of King channeling that specific uh, mood and tone um, of a gothic novel. Um, but but yeah, I mean it it like I wonder I wonder if 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 some of the original ideas of all this stuff like it, you know the 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 doll thing was first defined for us via Edgar's anger management doll, 
and I, and I wonder if that's an experience that King had or, or was talking to someone else in, in recovery after his accident that had that, that found themselves extremely angry and, and, um, and found, uh, like somewhat like that there was using a doll as like an anger management treatment and found that interesting and then rolled it out and expanded it out from there to, to be a, a, a key part of this novel. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's quite possible. Mm hmm. All right. So the, the, the guys are at a loss with how to proceed with this whole thing. What does the doll do for us? How does this help us in any way until Edgar sees the strange way Jack is holding Novine and realizes uh, that this kid apparently used to be really into ventriloquism. It just so happens that Jack like super into ventriloquism at a younger point in his life. And I, I want to talk about our favorite, our favorite bad word <laughs> that's used in talking about books sometime uh, contrivance contrived, you know, the, a word that we agree to hate. Um, <laughs> but I want to talk about it in relation, in relation to this for a, bit, a minute. Sure. Um, are you, Scott, are you saying that it's contrived that, uh, no, I'm saying, Jack I'm, would... I mean, yes. In that, like the way we've talked about this before, that it's a story and everything is contrived. But I mean, right. I guess the thing that fascinates me about this is cause it, it, it could play off as just like, you're telling me that the guy that he just so happened to hire to help him out just so happened to be a ventriloquist in his former life. And that just so happens that's exactly what they need in this moment. And like, the answer is. Yes, actually, I am right. literally telling you that because that's the way King's universe works. Like that is why, if you want to talk about it from a Watsonian perspective, that is why King introduces the entire concept of a higher power helping and assisting and 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 intervening and pushing things towards a, a good outcome. Um, that's this is why. And is it is it cheating to do it this way? I don't I don't know. Like. I guess maybe, but like, it, it's just like, it's putting up, you know, scaffolding on your decision, your story choices. Y yeah. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think you and I just agree too much. This is just kind of uh <laughs> people agree. What's the word? Violent agreement of, of yeah. just like, like <laughs> stories are just a series of contrivances. And yeah, I, I, I think, I think there are sort of rules that you follow about how not to make it feel that way, but it obviously is that way. Um, yeah, but isn't it weird how like it, I don't think King's following those rules here. I think he's just saying, well, yes, however, that's the point, um, yeah. which feels like cheating in a way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, King King does it on purpose and then he calls it Ka and, yeah, and, and uh -huh. he kind of gets away with it. I think the other reason he gets away with it, like in a case like this, though, is that it doesn't really matter. Like, it's, no, yeah, it's not yeah. it's it's not like it's like, oh, uh, you know, the whole book we've been wondering, how are we going to get, you know, how are we going to get the vault open? And then at the last minute, you find out like, Oh, Jack had the key like in a locket on his neck that his mom gave him when he was. It's like <laughs> that would be the sort of thing where it's like that's not like that's not satisfying. That doesn't feel like. But but th this is just one of those. This is a minor plot beat where it's like, oh, there's a doll. What are we going to do with the doll? Yeah. Oh, and then we kind of finally realize like we 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 knew we knew there was a reason Jack was here, and here's the reason, other than just being kind of a cool stand up guy who's who's helpful. Yeah, I mean that that's a good point. Like it, it's only like it, it only feels like a contrivance because we created the situation for the contrivance in the first place. Like, like right. enough to put it, it's not like it's not like he wrote himself in a corner and was like, oh shit, there's a doll in the chest. How am I going to have them talk to the doll? Oh, I have to suddenly decide that Jack's a ventriloquist. It's like, no, you put you put the doll in there. You could have just had the pictures in there, right? Like, like it, it, it's it's intentional. Like, it's intentional that the story is telling us that, oh, yes, Jack was the exact person you would need to be here all along. That's the point. Um, yeah. And, and, and I, I do think that's why it works. I, I will say, like, that, and I know some of our listeners um, might be uh, absolutely shocked and horrified to learn this, but some people don't like Stephen King. I know. Calm down. It's okay. It's okay. Take a breath. Um, and, and this, this could be in my estimation, one of the reasons that these things that really don't bother you and me at all, um, could be a thing that, that breaks people out of, out of yeah. the novel, that everything ha has this, uh, I don't want to use the word contrivance, but everything has this, like this 
explanation it was always going to be this way thing that just this frankly comes comes out of left field like jack's ventriloquism is not a thing that was cleverly set up earlier in the novel that we're like aha <laughs> i remember that one time when he said he really enjoyed a good dummy and then it's paying off here uh no that that never happened right this is just uh-huh. literally something that this is the first time we heard jack's uh pleasure with ventriloquism was here right now um yeah and that could bother people it could I, it I, doesn't me I mean, it's funny. I, I I think, yeah, there's definitely people who have like extremely specific ideas about how storytelling should work. Yeah. Which, which normally that only works to their own detriment because it just makes it so that they enjoy stories less. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I personally, it's not that I don't have my sto- theory of storytelling, but I don't try to impose that on things. And, <laughs> but but like I think fundamentally the reason, the, the fundamental reason I don't care about this is that my actual emotional reaction in the moment of like Jack's a ventriloquist was actually to get one of those like slow spreading grins on my face of like <laughs> realizing like, Oh, this is going to be creepy and awesome. Yeah. Like, this yeah. is, this is going to be like, I don't care at all that it comes out of left field because you have surprised me with a delightful gift, which is now we get <laughs> creepy talking ventriloquism doll, which is not something I was, I was expecting. Um, no, I agree. I agree. It is one of those delightful things. And the scene is sufficiently creepy. You're right. Like this this whole process of how it starts with Jack's voice and then slowly turns into a different voice, which we only realize a little bit later is 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 Nan Melba uh, talking through the doll. Um, it, it's it's kind of wild, right? Like it's one of those things that like if you were to we've done this exercise so many times, but if you were to like explain it devoid of context to someone, it would sound absurd <laughs> and 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 yet in this moment it just works and is it is so creepy and wonderful it's honestly i haven't mentioned this yet but like this book is so visual and i kind of can't believe there hasn't been an adaptation of it yet because there's so many scenes in this book that i think would just work wonderfully on the screen um and i think this is one of those like you can imagine how this would play out maximally creepy and I it makes me mad <laughs> that no one's adapted this thing yet. Yeah, isn't it interesting? It, it, the paintings, the the sort of set pieces, the the creepy yeah. ship, like all of this seems like it would really lend itself toward um, a movie. I, yeah. I kind of, um, I mean, the, yeah, shoot, you know, the first thing that comes to mind in terms of a reason why not is like, well, it's got a super downer ending. <laughs> who, who wants <laughs> but to? That, I mean, they could change that if they really wanted they to. Could, they did it. They, they did it with Cujo. So, yeah. Yeah. But true. Um, I mean, give it to Guillermo and he can also play Wireman and then everybody's happy. <laughs> oh, my God. He he would be a good Wireman, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah so I, and that was kind of a, a, a tangent, but but. Yeah, I mean, I, I love the sequence. I, it's great. It's weird. It's wild. And it works on me. Me too. Yep. So uh, we, we learn through Noveen. Basically, we get the whole story. Uh, one of the things we get is that Charlie, We, you know, I don't know if you remember that Charlie was a name that was kind of thrown out and mentioned uh, before, but we didn't really know what it was. It's the name of the lawn jockey, um, the, the ghost that's running around. Um, and we we learn how Percy through Libet actually kind of terrified nan melda and some of the other children and even when Libet realizes what was happening she still had to draw and i I don't know if we've made this connection yet that this book uh, but we've obviously made this connection before is that just once again another instance of a character having the shine and and just needing to use their power i.e you know the breakers needing to to break right like this is just like a constant refrain in King's universe that when you are gifted these powers, there is just a need to use them. Um, mm-hmm. And, and we've compared that with like the need to create and the, in the art side of it. But I also just want to want to tie it back to, you know, these powers that people are blessed with are, are demanding to be used in some way. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think once again, I'm going to have to say, I think a lot of this book is autobiographical and, and King talking about his own relationship with his own, art yeah. and I, I can't help but feel like he's talking about his own feeling about about creativity how he, he almost can't stop himself yeah i agree i agree um again we learned something that we kind of already knew with with some of the stuff matt uh that getting rid of of percy was actually nan melda's idea not Libet's, as she is 
four four years old <laughs> so her right. coming up with a complex strategy might not make a lot of sense that's true yeah um i i really enjoy this this shift um i mean i think one one interesting thing about this section in general and i think we'll, we'll go into this in detail is is to put nan melda front and center of yeah. this part of the story like quite suddenly and unexpectedly yeah i mean uh, Edgar basically says a little bit later that like, she's the real hero of this whole thing mm-hmm. that like the, the thing we were attributing to, to Elizabeth and her bravery as a young kid, which, which I don't want to diminish was, you know, Nan Melda's idea, Nan Melda making sure it happened Nan Melda essentially sacrificing herself to make sure this happens. And yeah, she just hasn't been like, she's been in the periphery of, of the, the story if like every how to draw a picture or just about every how to draw a picture section mentions her in some way but yeah like she's just not a a a big character that suddenly but suddenly comes to the forefront in the end and and i'm jumping ahead a little bit here but i'm i'm curious like did that did that work on you or was that like too too suddenly too late um do you wish we had gotten more characterization more time with her earlier in the book if this is where we're gonna go so um I, I think, so, so my answer to that, and, and it's, it's fine. We can, we can jump ahead because I think this is as good a place to have that conversation as any Sure. is, is like, for whatever reason, I feel really inclined to talk about editing when it comes to this book. And, okay. and I think the reason is that this is one of the rear King books where King doesn't immediately spoil absolutely everything immediately <laughs> true, um, true. And, and intentionally. And so like the pace at which information is doled out uh, it becomes very important. He's he's really controlling our attention a lot more carefully mm-hmm. than he often does, um, because he often just tells us what's going to happen, um, and then and then it's the how that we're interested in. In this case, we don't know the we, we we don't know the how, and we also don't know the what really. We sort of we sort of basically know well somehow things in it, somehow Elizabeth survived. <laughs> That's kind of all we know. Um, uh-huh. uh, and, but like if we had centered Nan Melda earlier, um, if we had if we had made it, if we had made her role and things more clear and more obvious, I think that would have just, I think it would have done nothing positive for us and it would have really tipped the narrative hand. It would have just told us like, you know, why are we focusing on Nan Melda so much? Oh, well, it must be that she's important to the resolution of all this. And, um, and then there's no, it's like, okay, f- fine. Like you, it, it just robs us of this feeling of like, ah, that explains it because mm-hmm. up until, up until that point we had been wondering like, what happens? What happens? Like, how did they get out of this? Like who it's, it, it, it's, it was a fun mystery to think about, to think about how they, um, how, how, how little Libet survived and, yeah. and what happened exactly. What was the nature of the tragedy that we just see in sort of echoes in these different paintings and drawings? Yeah. Um, and, um, I mean, yeah, the, the, I, I, yeah, go ahead. No, I just, I, I was just going to agree with you. I, I, I struggle to find a way you can kind of prop up nan melda in those sections without taking something away from the book because i mean i think you would just feel like i i think you would just be like okay obviously she's gonna matter in some huge way to this whole thing in a way that yeah i agree with you kind of ruins that that mystery yeah and i mean it's not like it doesn't point her out like she's frequently in the pictures and mentions yeah. her name re- repeatedly i mean many many times so if anything you could you, you could also say like hey matt don't you feel stupid for not thinking of this because because <laughs> she is a character who was in who's consistently been in it and it and i think my attention is just sort of brushed over her and been like well yeah we'll see um you know i mean edgar overlooks nan melda and mm-hmm. thus we also overlook nan melda yeah and So this is a good little sleight of hand there, but she is always there actually. Yeah. And and perhaps, you know, the author is a genius and everything's intentional uh, and all. uh, Percy overlooked Nan Melda to her downfall, to her doom, right? I like that. We weren't paying attention to her. We weren't valuing her. um, And then she was able to get one over on the villain because of that. I like that a lot. Yeah. So Matt, one one structural thing that I think is is worth noting here as we kind of continue with this this relaying of information from this this doll is that we are kind of in the middle of sections breaking into italics as as 
Edgar continues to channel Noreen with, with drawings, italics that have thus far been exclusively used for the how to draw a picture sections of the book. In fact, we're kind of seeing those sections invade the story. And I, and I think that's exactly what, what King is doing here. Um, he's, he's signaling with these italicized little mini segments in the middle of the chapter that that is where those sections are coming from, is that right now you are seeing essentially a how to draw a picture segment invading the normal chapters of the story through Noveen. And I think that's just kind of delightful. And I wonder, like, is that the type of thing that y- you you lost because of the audiobook? Like, you, you can't see italics, you can't hear italics, rather. So uh, I, I'm curious. Well, may, I mean, maybe a little bit because I, I, you know, I didn't realize that that was italics, but I did feel like um, we were we were delving back into that past timeline. I, I, I mean, I, I think short answer is yes. I, I did. I did miss mm-hmm. that we were doing that, but at the same time, I mean, um, I don't, I, I, I understood what we were doing overall. I guess. Yeah. That's a little stylistic thing that, that does get lost. I, I, I think that's interesting. I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah. I mean, I'm constantly, the reason I ask is I'm just constantly curious about this thing. Like, you know, I am, I am obviously of the, of the, the opinion that audio booking is, is reading just like reading is, but I think there are, there are drawbacks and benefits to everything. Right. And, and that sometimes some of the, the stylistic choices that are done with font or page layout or things like this are just kind of completely lost. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. You know, this is one thing I just hadn't talked about much this book. Uh, I don't talk about much in general because, um, it's, um, uh, it, it would, it would be tedious if I talked about it, as much as it occurs to me, honestly, but <laughs> like, like the, the, the choices in how the voice actor chooses to sort of portray, uh, to embody Edgar and Wireman, um, really kind of dictates for you how you feel about those characters. Yeah. So no, like that's, that's, true. That, that's one element of audio booking that I'm not totally satisfied with like it, it is it is what it is like I, I i mainly do audiobooks just because of like practical reasons um but i do, i like i feel like there a little bit is lost by the fact that the the audiobook reader is kind of deciding who wireman is t- to to a larger degree than would happen if i were reading wireman's you know words with my eyes um yeah sure uh, you know him, him and the the reader and his director uh, who's directing him which importantly in most cases are not the author right so yeah. like it is in essence an adaptation in a lot of ways like you are taking a performer and a director's interpretation of the text and listening to that which yeah i mean like everyone does that like when i read it i am adding my interpretation of the text as i'm reading it but with you in audiobooks you've almost added a middleman there and it does become a form of adaptation in a lot of ways. Yeah. No, I, I think, interesting. I think so. And, and just to round out that point, cause I wanted to mention this at some point, um, the, the audiobook readers like vocal tone for the last pages of this book was so like dreary and dour <laughs> and, that, that I felt that it imp- I, it probably impacted the way that I felt about the book. Sure, um, you have to, yeah. And and it's like I was even aware of that at the time that I was re- that I was listening to it. I was like, it was making me sad. And I was like, how much of this is the way this guy is choosing to to read this? Like maybe maybe if I was reading it, it it would hit me with more of a like wistful hopefulness. Or, or mm. something. I, I can't possibly know because I didn't read it, but I, I just, something that occurred to me while, while, uh, while reading, while listening. Yeah, sure. It. Sure. Yeah. Again, you know, it's still, it's still reading, but yeah, it is, it is, it is different <laughs> for, for yeah. sure. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Matt, I, I love this moment when Wireman asks a very, a very good question here. Um, it, it says Jack's fingers flexed. Noveen's ragdoll head nodded slowly up and down. Wireman licked his lips. That doll, he said. Exactly whose ghost is it? There are no ghosts here, Wireman, I said. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so, uh, <laughs> so, so what was that then? What, what, uh, I think, so yeah, I, I love this because I think the answer is it's just the doll, Matt. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's just like literally, like, I guess if we want to get like really technical with it, we could say that like 
things that exist in this universe are imparted with power based on their import. And Noveen as a thing was extremely important to Libet as a child. And like, I, I love a little bit later in the book and I didn't, I didn't copy paste it out, but like there's a moment of it, it, Edgar mentions that like she was there and saw it all and kind of absorbed it. Um, uh-huh. the, the doll was like, cause the doll was with Elizabeth constantly and absorbed everything that was happening and absorbed everything from Elizabeth's point of view. And it's so like, it's it almost becomes a totem, uh, a, a symbol of power, a thing that, that is instilled with so much belief and importance that it, it becomes something almost that, that, I mean, that's my interpretation. I don't yeah. know if you agree with that or not. Well, I, I do like that. I mean, I have a somewhat less like enchanted interpretation, somewhat more literal minded, which is just like, we know that there was one picture of the of the doll that she drew, um, which, as your first thought, was a picture of um, Nan Melda. But then, upon seeing the doll, realizes that it was a picture of the doll actually. Mm-hmm. And so, perhaps Liz L- Libet just literally was like, "I I draw Dolly. Dolly talk," and now the doll can talk because yeah. that's how her magic works. Um, I mean, yeah, I think that's a huh, that's kind of a a way to, I guess, literalize the metaphorical <laughs> idea that I was creating. But I, I I think I think the answer is yes, both, right? Yes, I mean, I, I I think I think that what you said is correct, and the mechanism by which it happened is that she drew a picture of her doll. Yes, right. Yep. Yep. No, I agree. That's perfect. So the magic starts to wear off, and Jack is about done, but Edgar's gotten what he needs. He grabs Novine. With two arms. <gasps> it's a really cool moment. I really like it. Yeah. <laughs> I think Jack I mean, is it, like, when did you get your arm back? Yeah. So much wonderful build up to this. Yeah. yeah. And uh, away we go, Matt. Away we go. We, we leave this chapter behind and move to how to draw a picture 10. Here is the opening lines of that one. Be prepared to see it all. If you want to create, God help you if you do. God help you if you can. Don't you dare commit the immorality of stopping on the surface. Go deep and take your fair salvage. Fair salvage. Do it, no matter how much it hurts. I love that. I love that yeah. quote. I love that so much. So much so that I I tweeted it this week because I just fucking love it. Yeah, I, I love it. And I sort of feel like this might have been the germ around which the story formed. Sure. Yeah. Like, yeah. Or or this sentiment, at least the idea, like the metaphor of fair salvage. Sure. As yeah. as art, like the the, uh, the that that art that creation is like picking over the debris of some disaster and <laughs> and like b- being willing to put yourself at at physical and emotional risk to retrieve um these these bits of flotsam and jetsam and that's your fair salvage and that's what yeah. art is like that I I think that's a incredibly cool idea. I agree. It does that while simultaneously, I think, staying true to one of King's core tenets, which is that idea of truth, right? That like that the, the surface is not enough. You have to find the truth underneath everything, um, no matter how much it hurts. Yeah, you, yeah. I, I love that. I, lo- I love all that together. I think that's absolutely beautiful. Yeah. And that's that's, I think, been King from the very beginning. The, the thing that I was tweeting this quote to was um, uh, Margaret Atwood, the author, did a, a kind of thing in The New York Times about the 50th anniversary of Carrie, which is this year, uh, which is <laughs> crazy. Um, mm-hmm. and, and how even that book, even King's first book was a book that was, that was not just going to be a simple horror story, right? That it was going to dig down deep into some, some, some really dark places of uh, darkness of, of humanity. Um, and that's always been what King is. It's always, he's always been, wanting to dive under the surface. It's not just a monster. It's a monster that represents some core aspect of humanity that he finds absolutely terrifying. And uh, that is, I think, this quote to a T, in my opinion. Yeah, I didn't get a chance to read that yet, but I would like to. If I'm being entirely honest, neither have I, because I do not have a subscription to the New York Times. Yeah. So if anyone wants to yeah. copy-paste that into a document and email it to us. <laughs> that would be... So would, bad to do that. Yeah, that would be wrong. It would, be, would be absolutely wrong, wrong thing... to open up your email, type in <laughs> kingslingerspod at gmail dot com, <laughs> and drop the text of that that <laughs> article. Don't do that. Yeah, please don't. Um, bad. bad. <laughs> 
Uh, Matt, this ha- short how to draw a picture section shows us exactly how old poor Emery Paulson, uh, the ghost that visited Edgar uh, a, f- a few chapters ago uh, and eloped husband to the eldest Eastlake child, died. Um, it was thanks to the ghost of the two twins. Emery is led out into the water by a voice. And when he sees the two girls, he thinks briefly about how him finding them will will fix everything. He'll be the hero and it will repair the damage with his father in law. And he gets really excited and dives out into the surf and is grabbed by them and pulled under and, and drowned. So that's that's the end of old M. What'd you think of that? I was surprisingly sad for this character who I barely thought of for a single second prior to this. Um, yeah, because, you know, he he come. He, it, it's it's genuinely a horrifying idea that like he he's like so happy at this thought that he is going to save them. And then as he's like making his way out to them, he's like, that's kind of weird that they're able to stand up and I'm already waist deep. And, and then, <laughs> and then they get him and he's, and he's, his screams, you know, yeah. his, his uh, God, it was, it was really effective. I thought it was great. I agree. I agree. And it's one of those, I think vintage King, I'm going to make you care about this character. I just introduced to you five minutes ago moments. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the, the incredibly, like it, it, it pays off of the thing we knew the entire time, which is that that she ran off with this guy and, and the father hated it and was resentful of it. And that is almost immediately used to his downfall. And that I think makes you empathize with him a lot. Uh, it's really. Sad. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we move on from here to chapter 19, April of 27. Edgar is shaken out of his trance by his two friends, realizing that he's been drawing like a madman. I love this beat here, Matt, that he doesn't want water. He specifically requests Pepsi because this book is sponsored by Pepsi. Um, <laughs> no, no, actually, the reason is uh, is because he doesn't want to waste their fresh water. But you, the reader, and and none of the characters in this story know that yet. And it just is this like weird moment of like, what? <laughs> Why? Yeah. Why Pepsi? Yeah, at first you just think he's crazy. Yeah, yeah. So it's quarter past five, two hours left of sunlight, give or take. And so they're running out of time. The three head out to drown the monster. They see, Matt, when they look out into the gulf, the Persephone anchored out there wearing its daytime mask. And they know that if, if the sun sets, uh, they're, they're screwed. <laughs> it's over. Uh-huh. All the creatures are going to come get them. Mm-hmm. So I, I like this quote. I want to read it to you. Some, like the lawn jockey, are things that Elizabeth has created as a little girl. There are others that have come since Percy woke up again. I paused. I didn't like to say the rest, but I did it. I had to. I imagine I'm responsible for some of those. Every man has its nightmare, his nightmares. I do just like the reason I, I pulled this map because I, is the I, I didn't want to say the rest, but I did. I had to. This this core trait of Edgar, I think, that I think is really interesting is that he has to kind of be honest about this. Like he, like the, the, I had to is so interesting. Like why, why does that matter to you in this moment, Edgar? It's like, because I'm the type of person that takes responsibility and I intentional or not controlled or not, am responsible for some of the stuff we might see here today. And I have to, I have to take the responsibility for that. And I, I think that's really great. Yeah. I, I mean, Edgar, is a fundamentally a heroic and, and and admirable character, even though he has his his flaws, right? That's makes yeah. him a good a good Byronic protagonist, right? I agree. I agree. Um, re- regarding the nightmares, I mean, just to be kind of nitty gritty for a second, we know everything that Edgar painted, right? There's not like other paintings of dangerous creatures that he painted that we haven't seen, right? Yeah, I don't believe so. I mean, I, I I feel like I feel like the book has been pretty explicitly like telling us every time he paints yeah. something or draws something. I think so. I, I guess I was just hung up on the literal statement of like, wait, so there's I, I was like, so wait, what what monsters did Edgar draw? What nightmares did Edgar paint that are going to come for them? And I, and I guess it's like he painted like the skeletons at one point, I think. Yeah, like, I, I do wonder, like, I don't think we ever get any kind of actual clarification on this so we'll just say it and can't be proven wrong but like the idea of like perhaps once percy has kind of seized control on some level like when you are channeling through your painting like is connected to your mind in a way that um you don't have to specifically paint something for 
that thing to be brought to life. I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm kind of just talking out my ass here, but yeah. I mean, possibly. Sure. I, I'm. I'm. Like, I think I'm being overly literal. It's. 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 Yeah, I. I. I don't think it matters ultimately because it's not like sure. we saw a bunch of extra monsters that we didn't expect to see. Mm-hmm. It was just a, a transient moment where I was like, wait a second. What, yeah. what nightmares? <laughs> but I think that's the interesting part is because you're right. It doesn't matter. It's not like the book is setting us up for on the way home. We're going to see all these creepy monsters. And I want you, the reader and the other characters to know these weren't Elizabeth's. These were Edgar's. It's not doing that. But it is, in my mind, just another moment to hit a beat of this is who Edgar is. Yeah. And, and this is this is the type of thing he's going to do and the type of thing he's going to say. And yeah, I don't know. I just really like that. No, that, I agree. So Edgar relays what he learned while flipping through all the sketches. They drowned Percy in an old mini keg of table whiskey. And as we already said, it turns out Nan Melda is the real hero here. Uh, the one that had the idea, the one that kept Addie from trying to leave to look for Emery to protect her. And as we'll learn in a bit, the one who died trying to distract Percy to give a little bit, a little bit of time to drown her. I, I, I love, I love this. We already talked about this, but you know, like was this, was this too little too late? as a shift to make this character so important. And I think we both come to the kind of agreement that no, I mean, ultimately it it works. It functions. Yeah, I agree. Um, One little thing I thought of was just like, there's kind of the, um, the folklore idea that supernatural things can't follow you or can't cross running water. Right. Mm, Um, Yeah. 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 And um, this is not, it's sort of an interesting twist on that where it's not running water, but it's, it's, it's actually freshwater specifically. Yeah. Um, I just thought that was a it, it like kind of kept part of the idea in in a fun way, but twisted. Yeah, because there, there's a lot of vampire similarities, right? And this is another yeah. one that's not quite the same, but like a twist on that vampire idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah I like right. that. All right, so from here we move to how to draw a picture eleven, our penultimate how to draw a picture section. And the opening lines here are, don't quit until the picture is complete. I can't tell you if that's the cardinal rule of art or not. I'm no teacher, but I believe those six words sum up all I've been trying to tell you. Talent is a wonderful thing, but it won't carry a quitter. And there always comes a time if the work is sincere, if it comes from the magical place where thought, memory, and emotion all merge, when you will want to quit, when you will think that you put your pencil down, your eye will dull, your memory will lapse, and the pain will end. What do you think, Matt? I uh, once again automatically translate all this into writing advice. <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> I say, yeah, I think the book it, wants you to. Yeah, I think so. I mean, he's saying don't you know don't stop writing until the story is complete, even if it's taking you into uh, upsetting directions. Um, and I think he believes that. I mean, I it, it's funny. I keep having having this like halting uh, objection where I'm like, but you know. King also recommends putting his first drafts in a drawer for a month and not looking at them and then taking them out and editing them. So he doesn't literally mean keep writing until the book is complete, but I am being overly literal. That is the word for the day for me. (laughs) Um, And and I think basically vibes wise, he's saying, yeah, like get through, get through the book that's in you. Maybe, you know, you, you can apply this to the first draft, right? Like, like write it right out everything that's in you like the previous quote that you read said like don't don't stop at the surface go deep even if it hurts take your fair salvage write it all the way through don't stop until it's done um uh, I, I really love specifically the place where thought memory and emotion all merge i mean that's mm-hmm. that that's just such a great description of like f- f- uh, the subjective experience of writing something that you know is good which doesn't happen often but when it does it's like that's a great that's a great description of what that is yeah yeah no i i I agree with with everything you just said there i think it it is something we've been talking about from the very beginning is this idea that like a big theme of these sections specifically in this book as a whole is how scary and hard and painful this entire process is right like this is not stephen king writing a book about how writing is fun (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> Creating is fun. You're going to have a great time. It's like no, you're going to do incredibly powerful things, but but you're you're not even going to do it cuz you want to. You're going to do it because you have to. And and even even will, even so it's going to be hard and it's going to be 
painful and you have to push through. You have to keep going. And and this idea that like uh, what I like so specifically about this passage is like this idea, like you think you want to quit because quitting will make it easier. You know, you will think that if you put your pencil down, your eye will dull, your memory will lapse and the pain will end. You think stopping this process will will free you from this thing, this stuff, but you're wrong. You are wrong. And again, going back to the thing I talked about last week, this is a book that you could subtitle uh, why I almost quit and why I didn't end up doing it. Right. And, yeah. and this to me is another another bit in that is like this idea that, you know, you, you want to quit. You want to leave it behind. You want to say, I can't do it anymore. And something, something keeps you going. And yeah. this is one of those things that like you, you think that's going to make everything easier for you. You think just stopping when when it gets hard is going to make the, the the drive to keep doing it uh, go away. And you're wrong. <laughs> you are wrong. I don't necessarily want to talk about this here, but I th- find it so fascinating that Edgar does indeed stop painting at the yeah. end. Like, no, isn't, that, right. th- th- isn't that like a... That that almost clashes to me with the idea where he's telling us in these interstitials, like this is your, you know, it's your responsibility to to create almost, and and then it's and then the end is just he he's done and he stops and he's and that's it. Yeah, well, we have the final how to draw a picture section as well, right? The the, yeah. the twelve, which we'll get to. Um, that is, yeah, I think maybe explaining that that twist or turn of it. Yeah, we we can yeah we can save mm-hmm. that for when we get there. Yeah. So Matt, this is our longest how to draw a picture section in the entire book. They're usually just a one or two page thing, but this one is eight. As Edgar draws the final picture, he draws the day of the conflict on the beach of Dumaki. This is this is it. We get to see it all here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's uh, in a sense, it's the climax. Like it, it's I mean, the climax is what is like the next chapter, technically, I guess. But <laughs> sure. it, it sort of shares the space of the climax. Like, for, yeah. uh, let, let me let me say this correctly. The this bit and the climax to me just kind of ran together as a climax of emotionality for me uh, in the reading experience. Like I, I just I was carried from this moment through to the end of the climax as yeah. if this were all the climax, even though this is something that happened a very long time ago. Yeah, I mean, essentially, chapter 20 is the climax of the story proper, and how to draw a picture 11 is the climax of the how to draw a picture sub story, right? So I think that makes sense. Yeah. So we're in Nan Melda's point of view for this one as she dons her silver bracelets, something, again, that was told to her that she might need them, some force, some power gently nudging her um yeah she checks in on libet and then heads out to grab the elder east lake i do love matt here how she can't actually ask elizabeth if she understands what she has to do because they both understand percy's power and ability to hear at this point and so she just kind of has to be like what you doing just drawing and she's like oh god does this child this literal t- preschooler understand what she needs to do i can't ask her i can't like i think that's a cool little moment yeah yeah i agree yeah so on the beach addy is standing there as the emery zombie approaches her we watch as east lake trying to save his daughter accidentally spears her killing her then the twins appear with their quote new silvery voice and try to beckon to him oh this moment matt like so so much going on here (laughs) This, this is the this is the Achilles heel for me, I guess. This is the kind of stuff where I was like, "This is just mean." Have the guy <laughs> accidentally shoot his daughter while his other two daughters, his undead daughters, are try, are, are messing with him. I was just like, "No, re- yeah." Well, the, the 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 loss of a daughter is is a motif that's everywhere in this book, right? The loss of yeah. a child is just every yeah. character has experienced this in some way exactly i mean i think this just at this moment is just rubbing it in and really making it (laughs) horrible sure sure so we see that nan melda tries to push back the children to stop them and that is when percy herself appears and matt i think this is really i actually thinking about it outside of looking at the the little doll itself the one good view of the monster we get here so i thought i thought we'd at least talk about that a little bit Um, sure it says Melda still holding the Tessie thing by the hair. It fights and kicks, but she's hardly aware of it. Spins clumsily in the water and sees her standing at the rail of her ship in her cloak of red. 
Her hood is down, and Melda sees she's not even close to human. She's something other, something beyond human understanding. In the moonlight, her face is ghastly and full of knowing. Rising from the water, thin skeletal arms salute her. The breeze blows apart the snakes of her hair. Melda sees the third eye in Percy's forehead, sees it seeing her, and all will to resist is snuffed out in an instant. Oh, it's pretty cool. Yeah. It's a it's a Lovecraft thing. I love it. Yeah. It's yeah. it's great. I like how it's it's like it's described somewhat, but but I think still vague enough that we're that we're able to paint our own picture. Um in the in the minor details yeah i mean like it is interesting like we're told not even close to human and yeah. yet she's got arms a head eyes hair. Yeah. hair like so like you know like that 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 like what could it be and i think yeah kind of holding back like the full description i think makes it all the more lovecraftian because you're just like you have to you have to imagine in your head what this what what a person who has typical human traits or or physical characteristics but is described as not even close to human what could that possibly look like what could yeah. that co- possibly be to experience that yeah it's something uncanny i love it mm-hmm. fortunately though matt uh even though she's just lost the will to resist little libet does her job drowning her percy doll in the table keg, f- keg filled with fresh water percy is defeated hooray we win uh but but the poor poor Mr. Eastlake, thinking Nan Melda has just killed his two daughters, fires his spear gun one last time while calling her a, just a, a lovely word um, and kills Nan Melda. So that's r- rough. That's yeah. a real Pyrrhic victory, if you ask me. Yeah, I mean, this like this is what I mean. I, I, I'm not I'm not being funny. <laughs> like, like the book is very mean. The book, it, 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 it's... It, like it, it really rubs it in here. Like the moment, if I remember correctly, is like Nan Melda like gives a cry of triumph. Like we've we've done it. We've defeated the the great evil. And then like in that moment, she's killed like pointlessly and and utterly senselessly. It's, it's not even like uh, the the creature didn't kill her. It was literally just him mistakenly killing her after having mistakenly killed his daughter, mm-hmm. and and then like presumably losing his mind basically. It's just, it's very, it's very dark. Yeah, very, it is. Like unusually dark. <laughs> it's uh, gothic. Uh, it's it's gothic. Yeah, I mean, like it's like so the, the, the the once again though, it's like that. This is the vibe of the book for me. You're like, you know, they they won, they they defeated Percy, sort of. But like, it sucks. Like you don't feel anything good about it, and that's sort of where I'm left with a lot of the events of the book. Actually, is it's like they won, but. Uh, uh god jesus i mean they saved this little girl from being taken over by an ancient lovecraftian monster i I mean you you really have to look at it that way right you have to be like well it could have been worse they could have all died and it's like yeah okay (laughs) i guess i guess that's true (laughs) (laughs) yeah i I mean i i get it i get it um and it's it's designed that way right like there's this this real tragedy of it that you know she is this woman who as we said she's the hero of the story she's the reason why um the elizabeth was able to live and why this this evil was put to sleep for as long as it was and her reward in that is gone you're dead yeah yep but especially like i mean i don't i don't want to focus too much on it but like the use of of the n word in this moment i think is especially interesting because like she has has been always described as essentially a member of the family essentially the mother to these children right and then yeah. in in her last breath he you know separates her by by racially slurring her right like he yeah. he like it, it you know, I, I, I don't want to I don't want to read too much of it and say his true colors come out. But like you don't like that word doesn't pop into your mouth unless you're you're thinking about it fairly regularly. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. It, it, yeah, exactly. It's 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 utterly heartbreaking because it's mm-hmm. it's like in, in her final moment, she is like othered and rejected by this guy yeah. who, like you said, has been essentially family, um, essentially family. I mean, so, someone very close to her, however you slice it. And yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, 
just just after seeing one of the other girls die in front of her who who sh- sh- you know she has what we see from her point of view that's one thing we haven't really talked about explicitly is this this bit is sort of she is the pov character effectively for all of this mm-hmm. and and we see that she loves these girls as if they're her, her children um yeah yep and so this is all just as horrible for her as it is for him it's just that she knows kind of what's going on supernaturally and he yeah. doesn't um and that i mean for me that was another level of of tragedy to the whole thing is like if she could explain to him what's going on then things might have gone differently but he's too broken up in grief and also there's just like practical logistical issues with communication with the demon listening in um and that just makes it like this unnecessary senseless tragedy yeah yeah i mean you're not wrong uh, <laughs> but but like I, you said, it's intentional. I'm not like yeah. don't don't hear me as like lambasting the book. It's like the book <laughs> is explicitly a series of senseless tragedies. Yep, yep. <laughs> that's what he's yep. doing. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, yep. That that was what I was gonna say. So yeah, yeah. no, I, yeah. I agree. All right, Matt. Let's move on to chapter twenty. Percy, our climax chapter is here. Edgar notes the picture of John Eastlake murdering Nan Melda as the second to last picture he ever creates which is a a fun thing king does here as we spend the climax wondering what edgar will draw last did you do you guess it matt would you did you get there at all uh no i don't think so that's fair that's fair i don't i don't think you would like the the assumption that well i'm just gonna make a storm that kills this place i mean i think i think that as soon as i realized that i was like oh this is the cover of the book (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah uh, so we learned that Percy was drowned in a cistern, also where Nan Melda and Addie's corpses ha- happened to be hidden. Uh, and fortunately, Matt, the actual lawn jockey statue was left there on the cap to kind of note the spot. Uh, but before they get there, they'll need something to put Percy in. And so they head to the outbuilding where all the booze was hidden, hoping to find another uh, table to put uh, to put the, the doll in. I found it funny how much time we spend on the problem of finding a watertight container. Yeah, just, yeah. It, it, not a complaint. It's just like, oh, we're spending a lot of time <laughs> looking for a container. <laughs> that was funny. I, is it? Is a flashlight too watertight? I mean, I kind of want to test this this theory. <laughs> just get I, a flashlight I, out and see if I can fill it with water. I think there must be some must be watertight because you can bring them into the water, right? So true. Yeah. yeah. Um, especially if it was like a dive light, although I don't think they explicitly say whether it was a dive light or not. I don't, I don't know if they did. Yeah. Dive light would have been watertight and that might be something you would expect to find on a Island, but sure. Knows. Yeah, no, that's fair. <laughs> uh, so as they open the door to uh, the shed, they're attacked by Chekhov's Heron. Uh, but fortunately, Matt Wireman blows it away with Chekhov's Desert Eagle. So <laughs> that's that's that taken care of now. It, it is. So I was going to save this for later, but it's very funny how we've read like basically a sequence of books from it, the desperation to this one where we, we've just built up to the point of having the evil possessed bird attack the man, but then just immediately get blown away by a Desert <laughs> Eagle. And it almost this is almost like a a satisfying answer to the events of desperation. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, that, I I hadn't thought about it that way, but you're so right. Um, it, I mean, it's kind of designed anticlimax, right? Uh-huh. Like I, we spend a lot of real estate discussing, Oh, there's this fucking Heron around here somewhere. And Ed Edgar brings it up to Wireman multiple times. That, hey, if you see this Heron, shoot it. And then what does the battle with the Heron look like? It's over in a half a second. Yeah. And then we're done with it. Moving Good. on. <laughs> Good. <Yeah. laughs> uh, unfortunately, all they find in the outbuilding is smashed table kegs. Nothing they could seal Percy in that wouldn't leak. They're at a loss and Edgar thinks they might actually be beaten. And here, I think this is an important thing that we see near the end of the book here. We see that old red Edgar start to come back. But fortunately, Wireman is here to calm him down. I love this here. Easy, Vato. That won't help. No, it wouldn't. And she'd like me angry, wouldn't she? The old angry Edgar would be easy to manipulate. I tried to get hold of myself, but but the I can do this mantra wasn't working. Still, it was all I had. And what do you do when you can't use anger to fall back on? You admit the truth. That's an interesting passage, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I I think 
I think this was part of what kind of made the anger thing click for me ultimately. Oh, oh do tell. I mean, because I've wondered, what are we doing with like, like, what is the element of the anger doing character wise? Like, yeah. where are we where are we going with this? In other words, and I think, I think this was close to the the crux of it. I don't quite know if I can articulate it, but I'll try. Um, it's like th- the the anger is keeping you from the like like the the honesty of creation or the the authenticity of creation or something like mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and that and so it's it, it, it in in that way it is connected to this theme of creativity of of art um this is i i'm i'm sort of annoyed in this moment because I distinctly remember while listening, feeling like, ah, I get it. I'll have to remember this to talk about it on the <laughs> podcast. And now it seems to have escaped me. And and the, the like the, the shape of it is something to do with how it connects to art and 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 how how the anger is a kind of um, excuse you could say to yeah. to push yourself away from the the like rawness that is required to actually do art correctly. So something like that. No, I like that. I like that a lot. And to, to once again, do the thing that we always talk about how we try not to do, let's make this autobiographical and uh-huh. let's talk about, you know, King and, and the work he did post immediately post accident and perhaps him getting this feeling of looking back on it now, six years later, uh, I was, I was just too mad at the world at, at this, this time. And I was just too mad and too angry and it, it affected. Cause there's, there's a lot of stuff that comes out of his post accident stuff, you know, dark tower, uh, aside that isn't, isn't too great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, like, uh, um, uh, dream catcher comes out about this time. Uh, and that's a, a mess of a book. Um, there's, there's a lot of good there, but there's also a lot of, um, you know, eh, stuff yeah. in there as well. Um, and I do wonder if like he is, looking at looking at the 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 work he did immediately after the accident and and thinking back on it and thinking of like oh you know i was trying i was trying to do all these things i'm talking about in my how to draw picture sections but i was there was too much getting in the way there was too much anger and th- i mean the that anger is a, a a core part of of edgar's journey throughout this the story and getting away from it and and moving past it and yeah uh, it, it no no coincidence that he's threatening to backslide here in the final moments of the climax and it's like what 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 do you do when you can't fall back on anger anymore you admit the truth and truth yeah as yeah. king always says is the most important thing yep um yep. W- with writing with creativity so yeah like what you said about being like kind of a crutch and an excuse of, yeah. of like yeah like i think the, the truth in this case is is i can't do it right just admitting I can't do this. Admitting that you can't do it by yourself, that you, the thing you're struggling with is that you need help, that you don't know, that you're not sure. Just admitting, admitting your weakness and your failure um, instead of getting really furious and pissed off about it. Cause that was Edgar's original source of anger, right? Like the reason he was getting so mad is because he couldn't recall a word and he felt limited and, um, and denied and had to give up his sense of self and sense of control and it pissed him off. And yeah. instead of getting pissed off about it, admit those things, admit those things to yourself, admit those things to other people. Yeah. And, and accept them too. Right. I, I, yep. I mean, yeah, yep. like he, he gets, he gets mad at the idea that they, 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 they point out like, you know, Hey, you only have one arm. Maybe you shouldn't be the one who does the physically dangerous thing. Mm-hmm. And it makes him angry. And it's like, well, the truth is he, only has one arm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it would be more risky for him to do this, but but may, maybe maybe he can admit and accept that, and then do it anyway. You know, like mm-hmm. like there's not like the, just to you know, King was in a lot of pain, had a dif- had difficulty writing. Getting angry about it isn't going to change any of that. Admitting yeah. that it's true and then just doing it anyway seems to be kind of his <laughs> his his approach. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. No, I like that. I like that a lot. All right, so we have this problem of what the hell we're going to put this doll into to drown it, but uh, it seems like Jack has a plan for that, and so our characters don't need to worry about it. But but it's not a plan he he tells them right away. This is like, speaking of, we, we've talked about, oh, we think these things could be complaints about the story, but we, you and I don't have uh, an actual complaint about it. This is one of those things that I actually 
do. It, it feels very weird in this very specific me kind of pet peeve way for a character to just be like, ah, you don't got to worry about that. I'll take care of it. And then we just move on. And it, he doesn't bring it up again until they're like <laughs> at the cistern uh-huh. ready to go down. And it's like, what happened after he said, don't worry about it, I have a plan. Did they just shrug and go, uh-huh. okay. Oh, okay. Like, why <laughs> didn't you just tell them then? Why? Uh uh-huh. yeah, it didn't didn't feel natural. It was yeah. it's it's your classic pet peeve, yeah. Yeah, I mean it's just it's just like the the reason is because King thought it would be a better moment to have it, you know, as he's going down and he hands him the flash. Like I think in his mind he envisioned the scene of um of handing him the flashlight and being like, I'm not gonna be able to hold it and go down the ladder, and it'd be like, No, no, it's not for that. It's it's to put her in. And I thought he thought that would be a better way to reveal the plan and i agree with him i think that's the more dynamic interesting way to to reveal the plan but then don't have him moments before say don't worry guys i got a plan like no there is no situation in which that happens and a person doesn't say okay yeah tell it to me yeah given that this is a life or death situation (laughs) explain just a very a very scott pet peeve if you've been listening to me long enough that's like when characters don't say things to each other they should just clearly say it, it bothers me yeah, it's rubbed off on me. So now it <laughs> bothers me now too. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, so they lower an 80 year old wooden ladder down in the cistern. And <laughs> don't worry about that. Uh, despite only having one arm, Edgar knows that this part has to be his. He grabs the flashlight from Jack and starts to descend, even as Percy begins to talk to them to convince them to stop and turn back. The ladder snaps because it's an 80 year old wooden ladder hanging out in a rotting shed in Florida. And Edgar <laughs> falls to the bottom of the cistern, landing next to some some friendly skeletons. Right. Yeah. Yeah, um, love it. Yeah, but it's really very creepy sequence. I really enjoyed oh. the um, you know, nightmarish horror of stumbling around in this black, you know, black, black, dark cistern full of skeletons yeah. and a little monster creature somewhere. Yeah, and of course, the fun part about the flashlight being the thing to store it in is that you have to make the light go away to to begin that process. It makes it more tense and wonderful. We also have Percy kind of whispering to our characters, especially Edgar, the whole time, trying to convince him to stop. We also have Wireman up up top being like, hey, uh, friend, there are people at the beach now and they're coming this way. <laughs> and um, it's it's all great. I actually really love that king never cuts away from edgar as soon as he's down on the cistern like we never i mean it makes sense because it's first person right so it can't but like i love that we can't see or know exactly what's happening above as the the zombies get closer and closer to wireman and jack like we only have to experience that through wireman's dialogue and jack's dialogue and and noises i think that's great yeah i i adore that element as well i agree Mm -hmm. So speaking of Percy, we get a a couple things here, Matt. First is this. It says, I'll kill you if you don't stop. But if you do, I'll let you go. You and your friends. I felt my lip skin back in a grin. And had Pam seen a grin like that when my hand closed around her neck? Of course she had. You shouldn't have killed my daughter. All right, we've done it. Pam is redeemed. Everything she's done in this book is completely justified Uh because he had a really super creepy grim grin when he choked her to death and he understands it now. So there you go, Matt. Um, interesting, interesting take there. No, you can't uh, refute it. Um, I wrote it, I wrote it down in the script. That's you did. And that's Mm -hmm. look, it says right here, Pam is completely redeemed. And I don't see you making a note under here saying you disagree with that. So that's true. Yeah. You had as, your opportunity as written. Yeah. Um, I, I, I just have to say, I love the language of, I felt my lips skin back in a grin. <laughs> it's so it, good. Yeah. It, it makes the act of just, you know, smiling, which we do all the time into this like g- gross, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. uh, sort of violent act. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, but I, I mean, I, I think it's, it's a great moment of comparison of, uh, of of matching these two beats, right? The story sort of opened in a sense with him st- trying to strangle Pam, trying to trying to kill Pam, mm-hmm. and here he's trying to kill this other creature, which you know essentially is is presented as a as a woman, as a female creature. Yeah. Um, and uh, the, it's it gives you without without actually quite literally saying it, it's it's like he has his hand around Percy's neck here. Yeah. 
um, mm-hmm. which I think is a very cool way of doing that without quite saying it. Yeah, and, and you know, we just talked about the anger that was returning and how the anger would be dangerous for him because the anger is what what Percy wanted. But I, I think it's it's different here, right? Like it's it, it was it was senseless and and out of frustration before, and this is focused and with purpose. Um, and yeah, so I think it it plays differently. Yeah, yeah. But Matt, we do get this. We get, and I, and I want to talk to you about what what we could possibly do with this. So so this is when Percy is trying to convince him to stop what he's doing. She says, "Then put me in your pocket, and we'll go together." She said, "We'll sail the world. We'll sail together into your real other life, and all the cities of the world will be at your feet. You'll live long. I can arrange that, and you'll be the artist of the age. They'll rank you with Goya, with Leonardo." And so, Matt, I have to ask the question here. We've we've constructed this great metaphor of of Edgar and Edgar's Edgar's, Edgar's creation as king ruminating on the act of creation as a whole and and specifically the act of writing. And within that frame, within that metaphor, what role does Percy fill? A, a muse, of course, like that defined as a muse early on in in, in the book, but of what kind? Yeah. I don't, I don't quite know. I, I, I was the 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 direction I chose to go in in pondering this question was like Percy is the kind of muse that makes you into a quote unquote great artist, mm. where that means a very specific thing. Where it's like someone who is recognized as a great artist. I mean, Percy even says basically here, it's not like Percy. Percy doesn't say, "I will I will make you able to express your you know." your truth or something like that. She says, uh, she says specifically they'll rank you with Goya with Leonardo. In other words, you'll be a, a famed renowned public figure. It's almost, and and I think that's so fascinating because as a muse that that's her, that's her power. She, you know, Mm -hmm. and that's what she gives Edgar actually. Like he gets to have this, this, uh, uh, showing this, this, um, blanking on the word showing yeah um, at the at the gallery and and it's all it's all about the the spectacle of it and his his you know the re- reception and the adulation that he receives for it it's not really about the art though i mean do you think i'm off the mark it it, it seems it seems we're doing something in this direction to me no yeah i mean, I, I think you're right just like the the idea of you know, I can grant you long life. I can grant you fame and success and importance. But yeah, no, like uh, one of the, the the first things we talked about was the idea of art for art's sake, um, and that is not what what uh, Percy is is promising. Is not promising. You will make great, true, powerful art. It's you'll be the artist of an age. Like you'll be remembered. Like it, it is all about it, similar to the what we talked about with. Um, with with Mary Iyer, like it is the commercial portion of this. It is the the fame and fortune portion of this, not art for art's sake at all. Yes, thank you for bringing that back because I forgot that that was we we had a perfectly good sort of handle to hang all this mm-hmm. on the the idea of um, art for art's sake. I mean, it, it's it's interesting. I almost wonder. I don't really believe this. I think I just want to believe that maybe maybe Edgar did keep painting. He just like put all his paintings in a drawer <laughs> and never showed anyone them or, or, or talked about them because he, he, he realized he didn't actually care whether anybody saw them. Um, and he, and he, he saw what that led to. Um, like you could see this whole story as the story of somebody realizing the folly of getting sucked into caring so much about what other people think of your art instead of just making it because you're compelled to. Yeah, you're right. I mean, this is this is not a story about a man who, you know, rediscovers himself via just just flexing these new muscles. It is a story about how he does that. And then it is almost immediately transformed into commercialism that ultimately destroys the people he loves. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's that's perfect. I mean, we could we could stand to talk more about this, actually. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the, the idea that it's everything is fine until he sells the art. Right. <laughs> and then. And then it kills yeah. everyone. <laughs> it's, yeah. It destroys yeah. his life. Yeah. Um, that's, that's, uh, yeah, it's exactly, <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
I did want to, at the risk of repeating ourselves for the 8,000th time, I did want to pose a possible metaphor for Percy here that is interesting to me. Maybe, maybe we can make this work. Maybe not. I thought a lot about addiction here. Um, and you know, that's something we've talked about hundreds of times with King. Uh, and it's because his books talk about addiction a lot. And, you know, again, one of the things I was thinking of autobiographically is King did have a brief stint of, of pain pill addiction post-accident. Um, that is something that happened to him. And I, and I wonder if you like so many of, of things in King's novels are metaphors for addiction. Like I think misery is, is kind of the most famous one where, where he specifically said that it, it just seems so obviously that any, any Wilkes is, is meant to be a stand in for like the obsessive fan that makes him uncomfortable. But he was like, no, no, any Wilkes is cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> this is any Wilkes is drugs. Um, and to me, like this idea, I, I, this is what really sold this for me is like this idea of this thing over your shoulder. That's promising you like, Hey, you like, I can, I can help you. Like, you know, you, we can do anything. You'll live long. You'll feel better. Um, you'll you'll be the greatest artist of an aid. All those like old insecurities of of who you are as a person and artist, and and the things that he probably got got over years ago when he first got sober, and then suddenly he's in this incredibly painful situation. These pills are making it feel better, and perhaps allowing him to work. Right, allow him. You know, he was suffering so much and was in so much acute pain that he was just not able to sit down and write. And these pills are the answer to that. No, it's like this is this is what I can grant you. This is what I can give you. Just come with me. Just just go with me. Um, I, I don't know. I, I could be totally off base here, and 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 I'm not even saying like this is clearly what he meant, but I do think there's something here with that. Yeah. Well, as soon as you painted that for me i was like oh yeah percy being cocaine also works very well mm -hmm. like just quite quite directly because it's like you know you, you succumb to this temptation and it makes you like incredibly productive yeah yeah you 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 painted how many paintings in how little of time <laughs> mr yeah. king you wrote you, you wrote this novel in in how long and it's <laughs> and it's so good and um I mean, it's gotta, it's gotta be hard to be, to be a creator and to, to sort of feel like you have this magic pill that you could just, it's right there. And it, and you know that if you took the magic pill, it would make you so much more prolific and productive and successful. Yeah. And, and but, and I think I, I honestly do believe that King had to like sort of come up with a story for himself where he's like, okay. How do I live with myself knowing that the magic pill is right there and not taking it? Like what? Like, yeah. And then he he sort of had to construct a worldview where it's like that's that's the 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 darkness trying to tempt me, and it's inauthentic, and it's commercial, and it's pulling me into all the worst parts of my creative self. Um, Honestly, I wish I had thought of this earlier, and I'm, I'm glad you pointed it out because it makes it takes it makes so much sense out of these bits where where it you know talks about like the dark side of, of creativity. I was like, I, mm -hmm. I I tried, I kind of fumbled at at the explanation for that. Never felt like I really did a great job, but it's like, well, the dark side, the, 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 especially when, when it comes to literal substance abuse, it's like, yeah, you you destroy your body and your relationships for the ability to you know be be more creative or be more prolific yeah. um uh, that seems like a pretty obvious dark side right yeah yeah i like it and and I, I really don't mean to talk about the same things over and over again but when they just they just feel so intentional to me i i, I feel like i have to yeah i i think I, I you know there can be multiple valid interpretations but i certainly enjoy that as an interpretation yeah Fortunately, Matt, uh, Edgar resists all this temptation, even as his brain starts confusing words again, like like we, we get this this old phrase, stick it up your friend, you dump birch. <laughs> Man, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm stuck on your interpretation now. It's like you take away the cocaine and your and your brain starts to feel dumb in comparison yeah. right and you start you you know it's it, it's like he literally he literally can't choose his words anymore which would be sure. terrifying to a writer specifically right um yeah i mean and and i know like 
I think the cocaine being cocaine specifically certainly does work. I, I in my head was always, Oh, pain pills, like yeah. hydrocodone, like that, that is kind of where my head went because the specific relation to this and, and yeah, like the, the idea that part of what made Edgar better, part of what was helping cure him was creating. Yes. Drawing. Yes. But drawing, with Percy, with this, yeah. with with my my old friend Percy, who I who gave me back my hand, right? Who who became my ghost hand? This part of me that I lost comes back when channeling this power yeah. um, through through this specifically through this 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 eldritch beast. So yeah, yeah, I think, uh, I, yeah, I think it's there for sure. Right. Yeah, I mean, so setting that aside though, I was I was really sad during this part as he begins to kind of backslide into mm-hmm. into losing his grasp on language because I I, I thought at the moment at least I was like, oh, is this are we going this dark? Like, is is he gonna lose his ability to speak and and we're gonna have sort of a um I don't want to reference the 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 work of art for to to protect people from spoilers, but those those out there will know what I'm referencing when I say main character gradually loses their mind and and powers of speech as we wind down toward the climax i was like oh no not this again Mm -hmm. this will this will destroy me and we didn't quite do that but it it was making me it was making me depressed at this point yeah i mean it would be i'm glad it didn't go that way because it would kind of be like what we're saying here is that every bit of progress that edgar made towards healing his his mind the, the brokenness of his mind was thanks to Percy and there and and in in her final moment she's taking that all back she's taking it away um, yeah. and maybe that's what what she was kind of going for here and maybe that's what King was going for here is that that's the potential that like you know the the, the progress was because of her and oh. we're backsliding because I like the idea yeah. that like maybe you feel like that's what's happening at first like when you yeah. when you first yeah. say no to the pills you feel like that's what's happening but that that that's transient it's just yeah. you have to you have yeah. to come off the pills first yeah um, no I like that I like that. So he smashes the keg and out comes the Percy doll. He sticks the doll in his shirt pocket while he works on filling the flashlight with water. And then nighttime truly hits and the statue actually comes to life, biting, scratching and tearing at Edgar's skin. Fortunately, he has the foresight to grab Nan Melda's silver rings and he manages to subdue Percy with them just long enough to dump her in the water flashlight. Matt, what did you think of the the statue literally coming to life? Is that is that a, a thing you expected? Did not expect it. I, I loved it. I thought it was super creepy. <laughs> I mean, there's something really creepy about a little tiny statue. Yeah, I don't especially know. one that can hurt you. Yeah, especially especially one that can hurt you and claw at you with its little tiny claws. I've always <laughs> always found that idea creepy. It, it reminds me of you know that movie uh, The Shadow with uh, yes, uh, yes. I, 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 that knife that the knife he has with like the little f- statue head on it that bites his hand. Mm-hmm. It mm-hmm. reminded me of that. This this moment I've thought about me that of movie that. in a long time. <laughs> But but now that I've mentioned it, you know what I'm talking about because it was I a very do. creepy, very creepy idea. Um, mm-hmm. And it, I think it also it kind of makes you realize how like desperate Percy is because she's like she's kind of cornered and she's clawing at his chest. Right? It's very yeah. visceral. It, it's yeah. It's it's not it's not like manipulation. It's not yeah. mental. It's all about physical now. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But now they can't f- find the cap to the flashlight, Matt. And there's I love this whole sequence where Edgar is holding the flashlight aloft, afraid to move it at all, lest he spill the water while Jack is like frantically coming down to try to search for the cap. Um, like I love he bumps it, right? Is like his hip thumped the flashlight. Cold water slopped over my wrist. Inside the metal sleeves, something bumped and turned inside my head a terrible black green eye the color of water at the depth just before all light fails also turned it looked at my most secret thoughts at the place where anger surpasses rage and becomes homicide it saw then it bit down the way a woman would bite into a plum i will never forget that sensation so like it's right there it has him if if the water leaves this thing at any moment we're fucked and, yeah oh, oh what a good scene yeah it's it's still so dangerous even at this point yeah i love it yeah yeah and i I love the idea of like my hand's so numb now i can't even tell if i'm sloshing water but if i correct because i think i'm sloshing water and i'm not i'm just gonna slosh more water and it 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 doesn't even have to be fully drained if it's just enough to get like the doll's head above the water 
it's over. It's totally over. God, what a wonderfully tense sequence. Another very visual sequence that I think will be really fun to watch in some sort of film like object. Yes, I agree. <laughs> Finally, they find the cap, screw it down, and they've done it. Percy is trapped. Um, before Edgar climbs out of the cistern, he talks to Melda one more time, asking if she if he can hold on to her bracelets because he has another thing to do. And I was curious, Matt, did you guess what that other thing was at this point? Did you did you know where we were heading from here? Yes. <laughs> this, <laughs> well, good is, for you. this is one place where I, I just got it right for once. Because, um, mm-hmm. you know, last week, I guess that that his his drawing of Elsa on the beach had had reanimated Elsa in, in some form. I didn't quite have the specifics that she was going to be a sand golem, um, <laughs> but I, I knew I knew where he was going. Um, I also, I mean, I think I may have taken it in a slightly darker direction. Like I think, well, n- n- not necessarily. I just, I, I think that he thought he was going to his death um, mm-hmm. and he planned to be going to his death, <laughs> but yeah. I, I think he, he survived, um, which was, you know, one of those silver linings. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, uh, I'm glad you, you were totally right in that. I thought that was really fun. I was trying to just be like, no, no, no. He just did it to know what happened to her. That's the only reason. Yeah. 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 Right. It was, it was a thin argument. It didn't make a lot of sense. Like the, the, there's too much importance placed on you will want to, but you mustn't for it to be just that. Uh, So you, you, you saw right through that. Yeah. And, and exactly. And, and too much importance made of the fact that he had done the, done the, the drawing or and like, you know, being coy about it. Yep. All right, chapter 21, The Shells by Moonlight. The Cotet returns to the new Heron's Roost only to find a message on the answering machine by a very confused police detective from Rhode Island with some questions about Ilsa's murder. King actually holds back the information here, just ominously saying, and the last piece fell into place. And perhaps you're like, wait, what piece? I I didn't even know there was a piece. What are we doing? I thought we were done. Everything here feels (laughs) like we're building to something, but what and i guess you had already known so the tension might have been drained a little bit there but i think for for maybe most readers they wouldn't have necessarily leapt the conclusion that you leapt to yeah maybe so that's an interesting point to to me i I, like you said i i didn't consider there to be any pieces missing so i was like what (laughs) what?" and then and then when it and then when it is explained i I was just kind of like oh okay (laughs) like it, (laughs) it, it, it didn't feel like a revelation that's okay. yeah yeah that's fair like it's just like ah yes there was salt water in the water which means that percy has access to her? what because <laughs> we didn't specify that if you don't die in salt water she doesn't have access to you well that, yeah that, that... like <laughs> if he had painted her and she didn't die in salt water is the is the conclusion then that he couldn't have created a and uh, ilsa sand golem i mean like, i think so obviously they can create things right like they well, Regardless of whether it's touch salt water, they have the ability to create things that didn't exist before. Uh, that's true. <laughs> I mean, I, I I feel like maybe this is one of those ideas where certain things didn't quite come together cleanly because it it yes, it is true that Percy drowns all the victims who later come back. Yes, right. Um, the like the the sister who gets shot with the harpoon with the silver harpoon like i think she specifically doesn't come back right Mm -hmm. yeah so so if we if we really are 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 paying attention to these details it might occur to us that like uh, uh she has to be drowned in a specific way in order to show up uh but it's like yeah like like you say it's like okay but we don't really fully understand the limits of this power. Whatever. I, I didn't, didn't, none of this yeah, bothered I mean, I me guess, in the moment. Yeah, good point. I, I want to, I wanted to explore this a little bit, but I, I think it is important establishing that when you're just reading the book, all this just works on you emotionally and none of what right. we're talking about right now matters. But yeah, to try to break it apart. Yeah. Essentially what is happening here is Edgar is, I guess, I guess the part where I get caught up in it is like, Percy didn't need someone to draw Emery to make him come back uh-huh. or or perhaps she did. Perhaps it was the fact that, that Elizabeth drew Emery is the reason he was, I, I, I don't, I don't I, know. I mean, my, 
not having thought about it very hard understanding is that anybody who Percy like lures out and drowns, she can bring back as a zombie. Yes, that um, that was what I thought as well. But then what is the significance of because because to me, the the point that makes this moment work emotionally is that mm. Edgar did this, that she's yeah. here because he drew her and summoned her. Um, yeah, that's true. So if, if it was true that like that that Ilsa can just come whenever Percy calls Ilsa, then what is the significance of Edgar <laughs> choosing to do the draw? Like, yeah. I mean, yeah. we're confusing ourselves of a thing that ultimately doesn't matter. Cause as we said, the, the, the emotional beats function very, very well. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's it, yeah. No, I, I think, I think it works fine. I, yeah. I, well, let's it, move it, on. It, we don't need to talk about it. The, the thing <laughs> is it, it may even make sense. It's just that I'm having trouble following it is all. Uh-huh. So yeah. I don't really, it's like, whatever, fine. Sure. Yeah. Um, all right. So regardless of, of that, Edgar knows uh, that, that he has to do this one on his own. And he says goodbye to Jack and Wireman thinking he might die. And I love this moment so much. I love you, Edgar. Wireman said, you're a hell of a man. Sano como una manzana. What does that mean? He shrugged. Stay healthy, I think. It's weird that he would know what it means. But um. <laughs> I, my, my interpretation of Wireman is that he doesn't really know Spanish and that he just picked up a bunch of random Spanish from his wife. I, I don't know that this is actually true, but the audiobook reader just does a completely normal American accent and then he says Spanish sometimes. So I I I, I like the I like the idea that Wireman just actually doesn't know Spanish and he's just picked up like hundreds of little aphorisms. Yeah, I like that. Uh, that's interesting. I always I always uh depicted it in my head as hispanic but uh-huh. uh and is he not <laughs> this he, is a, this is like that's the thing is he's often described in a way that would be compatible with a hispanic person but he the the the, the audiobook reader sure didn't do his voice in anything other than a uh uh you know the, the same exact speaking accent that uh, that edgar has yeah um so um make of that what you will <laughs> I mean, so so what this actually means in Spanish, like the literal translation is just healthy as an apple, but it's it's an idiom, right? So it's uh-huh. it's essentially us saying, you know, uh, fit as a fiddle, like uh-huh. Uh-huh. you know, like that 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 essentially like the picture of health, that kind of thing. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love I like let's pour one out for Wireman here man i i love this guy so much God. he's yeah one of my favorite king side I, characters for sure i love Wireman. i love their friendship yeah. i love yeah. i their 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 little frodo and sam thing they got going here it mm-hmm. brought me so mm-hmm. much joy i'm so glad that they got to live together in mexico and just be bros for yeah. for in, uh, happily ever after that is definitely how it happened yep yep um I, I, so I love this. He says, so then I took my last great beach walk as limping and painful as my first ones along that shell littered shore. Uh, so once again, this, this, I, this feeling of it's all coming back to the, to where it started, you know, yeah. um, it's, we're, we're cyclical in this and it's the, the beginning is the end. The end is the beginning. Yep. So as Edgar approaches big pink, he hears the shells talking again, only this time he recognizes them as his own voice. I love this writing too. I got a lot of things to read here at the end because I just love everything here so well. But I realized the shells were talking in a voice I recognized. I should have. It was my own. Had I always known that? I suppose I had. On some level, unless we're mad, I think most of us know the various voices of our own imaginations and our, of our memories, of course. They have voices too. Ask anyone who has ever lost a limb or a child or a long cherished dream. Ask anyone who blames himself for a bad decision, usually made in a raw instant an instant that is most commonly read. Our memories have voices too, often sad ones that clamor like raised arms in the dark. Ugh, I love that. Yeah, it's incredibly good, incredibly powerful stuff. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I also, I'm going to be weird and say, I think King means this literally. Like if, if you listen for your inner voices, I think you will hear them. I think we don't usually try to, but I think King is somebody who does try to hear those voices because he channels them. That's yeah, his job. Yeah. No, that's true. And and I love like what is what is a memory but a voice in your head talking to you, right? Mm-hmm. Kind of. Mm-hmm. So I, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. And waiting for him under the house is a woman, not Percy, 
But Ilsa, you were right, Matt. So, sort of. Uh-huh. Um, he's, it's a sand Ilsa. Yeah. Kind of like Ilsa. Spider-Man 3. Yeah, exactly. Or like Pirates of the Caribbean, where it's like a, it's like an undead creature made of ocean stuff. No, it's like Spider-Man 3. Oh, okay. <laughs> So Sand Ilsa asks Edgar for the Edgar for the flashlight, promising they can be together again. And Edgar reveals he doesn't actually have the real one; that it's back locked in a safe. And uh, and then he punches his sand daughter in the face <laughs> with the silver bracelet fist, exploding her. And and we're told, I guess, kind of hopefully releasing her soul, yeah, to go, you know, wherever souls go in in the King Universe, heaven, we'll say, right? Yeah. Um, like that. I, I like that idea. You know, we, we struggled with what is the the literal mechanics of how Ilsa is here and the salt water thing. I do like the idea of it, the dying in salt water means her soul has been kind of trapped on the, the ship of the dead that like she is not free to pass on in the traditional way. And so this is, you know, whether or not he literally created her, or she could have created blah, 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 blah. But like the, that method of death meant that Edgar needed to free her in a way. Um, and, and does yeah. so here. Yeah, I like that. I like that. That's 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 good. I mean, I, I I think you're right. I still found it incredibly sad. You know, poor Elsa, poor Edgar. It's all very sad. This is a very sad, very sad book. Yeah, I mean, this this final part of the chapter here, I'm going to read it so we can all be sad together. But for now, I would just sit here and listen to the shells, which no longer seemed to be talking in my voice or anyone else's. Now I would just sit here by myself on the sand and look out at the gulf and think about my daughter. Ilsa Marie Fremantle, who had weighed six pounds and four ounces at birth, whose first word had been dog, who had once brought home a large brown balloon crayoned on a piece of construction paper, shouting exultantly, I drew a picture of you, Daddy. Ilsa Marie Fremantle. I remember her well. Fuck. Yeah. Fuck. This book, man. Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> uh, chapter even, 22. It's not even done chapter with us. 22. It's not even... <laughs> It's not even over. We're we're almost there. <laughs> Chapter 22 titled June. Uh, a couple months later, we meet up with Edgar and Wireman up in Minnesota on Lake Phelan, ready to drop Percy into a freshwater grave that will hopefully, hopefully, Matt, last forever this time. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to hit this beat again that I think it, it is really funny that we read it and then Desperation before this, like mm -hmm. immediately before this, which followed <laughs> this pattern of like, our heroes are tasked by the white with putting down some kind of psychic, timeless, eldritch, Todash being. And in 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 two out of those three cases, not actually killing it, but just like burying it. Yeah. Right. Um, I'm specifically referring to desperation, obviously. Yeah. Um, interesting. Yeah, no, I agree. And also in two out of three of those cases, uh, silver being an important thing. True. True. Because one of them is just a bike. I, like I do that. like how like they've built like a silver container for the flashlight. So it's like in this giant big silver thing that they're also going to drop. Yeah. Yeah. No, that is, that, that, that's, that's a fun, a fun uh, extra level of detail. And also the kind of thing you would do if you were actually in this situation. Yeah. And, and also like uh, the thing that I like most about it was like, it's still kind of described to us as, only a temporary solution like the, the feeling that this is this timeless being that will eventually find a way to get out of this no matter what we do right like yeah. like i, I love the implication we didn't really talk about it but the implication that the reason why what, what cracked the table was a piece of the coral cistern breaking out and falling on it and putting a little crack in it which meant the water slowly slowly drained which meant percy slowly slowly came out and Edgar like wonders briefly, she do that? She like manipulate and push and prod like the, the power is contained, but not entirely stopped. And so the idea that like, oh, this is probably going to do better since it's we're putting it down this this deep chasm in this in this freshwater lake. So we have a much better chance of keeping her contained. But like this is a timeless being that that, you know, could perhaps one day get out. Yeah. I mean, I know we're not supposed to cross pollinate the stories this much, but I just immediately thought about David 
in the last book we read being like, not our problem. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. We did we did what was expected of us. Yeah, yeah. We we did we did what God told us to do. <laughs> Somebody else will deal with it next time it pops up. Mm-hmm. So we catch up with our characters. Linny is back in France. Pam is out in California now. Jack is going to school on Edgar's dime as a thank you. Wireman has given Heron's roost to and all of North Duma to the East Lake family and pocketed a nice chunk of change for himself and Edgar. Well, Edgar's not doing too great, Matt. <laughs> uh-huh. I, I, uh, this quote here really got to me. I don't mind looking at it that way, but I very rarely look at myself in a mirror anymore. It's not that I've aged. I don't care for the Fremantle fellow's eyes these days. They have seen too much. Fuck. Yeah. This is not the ending that we really wanted for our boy, right? Like, no. I mean, j- just to stand back, like, you kind of think you're getting into a book that's going to be about this guy who went through this horrible ordeal and then he has this journey of like healing and acceptance or something like like yeah. something in that space because mm-hmm. frankly that's just how these things always go and that's not really what this was this is mm-hmm. not really a story about a guy who 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 is thriving by the end because he just did you know the story taught him the meaning of life or whatever it's like nah man he 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 lost more he, if anything he lost more in this book than he lost in the accident in a certain sense. Yeah. Yeah. I think he'd, he'd give his arm <laughs> freely to have his daughter back yeah. any day of the week. So yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Ugh. Wireman points out though, Matt, in, in an effort to encourage him that lives don't have just two acts. They have five, like, like in Shakespeare. Uh-huh. Um, and they're a mixture of comedy and tragedy. And, for for him, for Wireman, his third act is heading down to Mexico to buy an old hotel. He asks Edgar if he wants to come run it with him, which is just marvelous, right? Yeah. And if you stop reading right now, yeah. <laughs> you're good. Right. This is classic. Don't turn the page. I mean, <laughs> I, like like seriously, this is like su- such a hopeful and beautiful and optimistic moment. Uh, and then you turn the page and you realize that uh wireman does not get five acts he gets two and then he dies no no he's like he gets like two and a quarter Uh, okay great (laughs) great uh one thing they do talk about is is uh the the final painting edgar is planning we we learn basically that he is going to draw a storm hitting duma key and he's gonna basically wipe it off the map he's gonna get rid of the key Uh, he's gonna drown it in the waves and make it so nobody else has to go there ever again. Uh, don't worry, everyone will be fine. He, he promises. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it, it is fucked it, up to the East Lake family. I love that bit. Like we, I settled with them by taking all the cash portions of the inheritance and giving them the land and the uh-huh. the, the home. Oops. So so I don't know. So so maybe I my reading lapsed. I, my interpretation wasn't necessarily that like the entire key was going to be gone, but just that like all all of the houses um and and surface stuff was going to be obliterated and then maybe like the island would still be there and they could rebuild that i just do you think i just misunderstood that maybe not maybe i've always just read it i've I, in my mind if my mind i've always just read it as he's gonna wipe this entire place uh-huh. off the face of the earth yeah um but no i mean it, it could very possibly be yours as well yeah i don't know uh so they drown Percy and spend the next few days together. And from here, we flash to the airport as Wireman tells Edgar it's time for Act 3. And then we get this. I willed him to turn back one final time. And he did. Must have caught that, a thought, my mother would have said, or had an intuition. That's what Nan Melda would have said. He saw me still standing there and his face lit into a grin. Do the day, Edgar, he cried. People turned and looked, startled. And let the day do you, I called back. He saluted me laughing, then walked onto the jetway. And of course, I did eventually come south to his little town, but although he, he's always lived alive for me in his sayings, I never think of them at anything but the present tense. I never saw the man himself again. He died of a heart attack two months later in Tamazukale's open air market while dickering for fresh tomatoes. I thought there would be time, but we always think stuff like that, don't we? We fool ourselves so much we could do it for a living. So there you go, Matt. 
Wireman is dead. Why? Why do we do this? Uh, I mean, I think I know why. I mean, it's it's this is a book about how life is not fair <laughs> and mm-hmm. how sometimes you don't get any kind of uh what's the word booby prize or or compensation for the tragedies that befall you life is not a narrative it's kind of just one damn thing after another and then you die um as my as my mom used to say life is harder than you die she would say this whenever i was complaining about some (laughs) trivial bullshit thanks mom yeah um and we don't like that in our narratives because we, we our narratives are a kind of escape where we get to believe that there's like a structure to the world where there's justice and like you get what you deserve. And if you're good, then you'll get a good outcome. Yeah. But, uh, but this is just, this is just, this, I mean, that's, that's like the King spends the whole book talking about the importance of the, the importance of being honest, truthful, going, going deep, going all the way, not flinching, not, you know, and and then he sort of does that, right? He provides us this story that's just like, yeah, sometimes it's like this. Sometimes, you know, you, sometimes you get hit by a van and there's not like a like a benefit. It's not like, and then, and then later, because I got hit with the van, that meant something good. It's like, no, it's just, it just literally sucks forever. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, yeah. Um, I, I don't know. That's. Yeah, I, I mean, I essentially agree. I essentially agree that this is this is uh, one final nail in the coffin of this idea that, you know, th- th- this final line, I thought there would be time, but we always think stuff like that, don't we? We fool ourselves so much we could do it for a living. This idea that, like, none of this is guaranteed. All of this is fleeting. It, 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 things could change at the drop of a hat, and you can't live your life, you know, afraid of that but but you have to live your life aware of of that these things could happen anytime yeah I, like my, my thing with wireman and, and i'm curious what you think about this is we meet wireman as a character who is essentially living on borrowed time like he shot himself in the head and somehow survived but the bullet is slowly traveling further and further in his brain and will eventually kill him and then wireman steps or then uh, then edgar steps in and essentially cures him of that um and his death at the end says to me, you can't do that. Like, like he, he was going, he was going to die eventually. Like this was going to happen. There was no stopping it. You, you can't, you can't artificially prevent that. Like there's, there's no, there's no magic. <laughs> there's no magic bullet erasing picture. Um, and so Wireman's death was inevitable. And I don't know, this is complete headcanon because there's nothing in the book that says this, but like, his his condition was slowly worsening and i wonder if the the non edgar interfered wireman died at the same moment he always would have uh just of something different mm. well I, I i mean i find that to be kind of a, a fun idea it never occurred to me i mean fun fun in a very sort of dark fatalistic way obviously but i i, mm-hmm. I like that um i mean i i, I it's like part of me likes what you just said for the symmetry of it and part of me just again finds it very demoralizing um <laughs> you know I, I i have this memory of like being like a kid like a quite a young kid and like having the first the first moment when i realized that happily ever after was this insidious lie because <laughs> because like happily ever after literally it, it's like you get to pre- you just kind of pretend for that moment that like that was the end and nothing and like everything was fine forever after that and it's like mm-hmm. that's not that's not how life is like like it's it's very much not how life is like everyone's life ends with painful gradual decline followed by death usually while losing a lot of people around you who are important to you on your way out yeah sucks it's super duper sucks and we it's kind it we love our, our favorite thing maybe you could even say on some deep evolutionary psychology level, the purpose of stories is for us to all pretend that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> um, but King, you know, King is a real artist. He's not going to let us pretend that's not true. He's going to tell us a story where that's kind of what the story is, actually. Yeah. 
And, and, and ultimately, like, the, 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 what this comes down to is what you come to storytelling for, right? Because there are people that absolutely come to storytelling because they want those happy endings. They want they want to believe in a world in which things do work out and everything ends ends well and happy. Um, and then there are people who want stories that get to the core of of the human experience. Um, and and I think King often does that. You know, like I oh I think King you know ha- sometimes likes to have his cake and eat it too, where he gets to core truths of the human experience, but he also likes to tell a good story with a good ending and. This is just not one of those. This is just one of those that um, ultimately what we're going to talk about is the 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 tragedies of human existence. And uh, what what can you do? What can you do in that? Well, I, I don't know. Um, just carry on. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. And then we get to how to draw a picture. 12, our, our last bit of the book here, which is just just two sentences. Know when you're finished, and when you are, put your pencil or your paintbrush down. All the rest is only life. Ah, goddamn. <laughs> Fuck, man. This book made me sad. <laughs> Maybe, I mean, is it just me? Is it the subject matter and the killing of daughters and I'm sensitive to this? Or or is this a widely shared opinion that this is a super sad and, and borderline depressing book? Uh, I mean, like I said at the beginning, I haven't had a lot of interaction with people in this book because I, I I felt like when I read this book for the first time, I felt like I was the only person who's ever read this book because I just no one ever ever really talked about it. So I don't have a lot of. I mean, let we'll let let the audience kind of weigh in on that. Like, were you were you as incredibly immediately sad as Matt was <laughs> during the the final the final moments of the story? I I, I definitely was. I I left this book being very very sad um i think i would be more sad now with a with a daughter that i can imagine as ilsa and imagine what that experience would be like a, a little bit more acutely um yeah i mean it, it it is a sad story edgar is left sad you know like i said i think there is a, a perhaps a, a a slight silver lining and he's 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 moved down to mexico despite wireman no longer being there he's he's agreed with his assessment that you know, you need to move on and, and find your third life. He's he's that's one thing he said at the very beginning. He's living his third life now and he's he's finding purpose and he has hope that he will have happy moments again. Um, But he hasn't had them yet. Yeah, uh, it's yeah, it's sad. It's definitely sad. Yeah. I mean, again, I think something we said toward the beginning is like it's just about perseverance and and, and living on and not pretending that it's like gonna be great it's just like that's what like all the rest is only life you just you just keep going and you do the best that you can um Mm -hmm. yeah yeah no i I agree i I love i love that idea and i love like i kind of want to talk to you about how i've been going for a while so maybe we can save this for next week but like we talked a lot about you know the, the the why i didn't quit um the the go through it all like and the the idea that (laughs) <laughs> you know you know this ends with okay but know when you're when you're done know when you're done um and and when you're when you are done let yourself be done um doesn't necessarily fit with with the the constant pull of the desire to create right yeah right i, I yeah just I, I I agree. Just I guess we'll we will talk about this again more. But it did it did strike me as a little discordant that he's constantly talking about how you you know it's com, it's compulsion. It's a it's a draw. Um, you you, you have escape. to express you cannot. it. Cannot. Yeah. 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 And then and yet, you just yeah. Or or maybe or maybe we can simplify this. Just saying it is a draw. It is you know to to put it in dark tower terms. You hear the song of the turtle and you go. And you have to go, you have to get through that. You have to dive through that. You have to journey through that process. But you also have to be able to recognize when that process needs to come to an end, that it can't be everything. It, 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 is, it, is, it is an important part of you. It is, as he described, like breathing, like, like being given a tongue, like being given a voice. But it also, it has to end. It has to end sometime. You have to be able to, to finish, to to push through that finish and recognize when you're done and set it aside and then do life. Yeah. I like that. Like that. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, uh, we will revisit these topics and others on our overview episode next week because we are going to take a step back and look at this whole thing from the forest perspective. We want to see all of it kind of look through. The, the other thing I want to do, and I'm, I'm saying this just to remind myself when I'm listening back to this episode later, that I, I do want to pull together the 12 how to draw a picture sections and just like that, that, that one or two sentence long word of advice at the beginning of them. I want to pull that all in one, one page just so we can kind of see them very clearly and see the progression of them and see if there's an overarching thing we can, we can pull from just those couple introductory sentences to each of these, each of these chapters. That's a good idea. All right. So that is Duma key. We did it. Another book down. Yep. Good book. 700th book. Yep. Feels about right. (laughs) Uh, As we said, the overview episode is next week. We are going to be joined by Kim C from the underrated Stephen King podcast. This is one of her favorite King novels. And so we had to have her on to chat about it. So, so I'm excited, Matt, because, you know, you and I have been tossing and turning and picking at these ideas and, and there's some instances in which we don't have a definitive conclusion yet. And I'm really excited to hear what Kim has to say about some of these interpretations where if she comes at it from a similar angle or, or brings an entirely different perspective as I'm sure she will. I'm, I'm super pumped about it. Me too. Yes. That's going to be delightful. Yeah. But before we sign off for the week, let's talk about discussion questions. Now, Matt, we asked uh, our listeners two questions last week, and I believe the intent of this was to have them pick one. <laughs> but uh, what did they do? Uh, almost 201. They they did both. <laughs> Son of a... <laughs> Scott, should we like flip a coin and just read one of each of their answers? The, the um, I, think that's what they, I think that's what they deserve, frankly. Um, <laughs> but no, let's go ahead and read them both. All right, fine. <laughs> first coin was tails by the way um (laughs) (laughs) uh baby can you dig your sand oh sorry yeah the the two questions were favorite creepy overgrown ghost house and favorite side piece monster meaning monster who isn't like the main monster Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. baby can you dig your sam says best side monster the face hugger in aliens it's fleshy and bony at the same time and fast way too fucking fast thing about the face hugger by the way is that it's hands that's what uh-huh. makes it creepy yeah um if you just look like at the, it it's, it's like the thing yeah with a tail it's got two it's two hands linked together at the palm anyway and then the other creepy overgrown house hands down the clopex house in the burbs one of my favorite movies of the 80s rundown house scary basement noises midnight digging a missing neighbor and Malachi from Children of the Corn giving a garbage bag from the garbage to the uh, uh, driving a gar- garbage bag from the g- garage to the curb and beating the hell out of it with a stick. An oft underappreciated Tom Hanks classic. Still this is seen not this the one. first time that Sam has mentioned the verbs. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. You're correct. Um, so we won't talk about that. I know you haven't seen it. Uh, yeah, the yeah. Joe Dante film. Good, good movie. Uh, Friedlock 68 says, while this is not what you meant by overgrown, the Navidson house in House of Leaves is continually growing in structure throughout the novel and is probably the creepiest house I can think of in general. The idea that the house can be slightly larger on the inside than the outside, the idea that a door can appear overnight, a door that leads to an endless pitch black corridor with no outside structure, the idea that said corridor opens up in a seemingly infinite room that is home to some faceless beast. All of this is so disturbingly original that I don't think any other house can compete. The book even has a cameo by a certain horror author. It's it's Stephen King. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Yeah, not technically overgrown, but uh, I will pick House of Leaves for yeah. any answer with a house. So I, I I'll allow it. Yeah, my my son is currently playing the House of Leaves Doom mod. I'm sorry. What? Oh, it's worth looking into, Scott. Okay, I uh, am. I'm leaving a note because I'm not going to do this right now. (laughs) It's a hell of a thing. (laughs) Uh, Friedlock also says, my favorite side monster war would have to go to Austin Butler's portrayal of Fade Rautha. The character's intro in Dune 2 was one of the more memorable scenes in the movie. We see this guy do some truly horrendous things with terrifying precision that the other Harkonnens seem to lack. Oh, I said it the wrong. Uh, Okay. Did you say Harkonnens before you saw this movie? No, I said Harkonnens. Okay, good. Because that's how it is. 
<laughs> it's Harkonnens. That's what everyone says except for Denis Villeneuve, apparently. Yeah, seems like it. And Butler's ability to emulate Skarsgård was so convincing that I originally thought that it was Alexander S. playing the part. Great movie and truly menacing side piece. Yeah, uh, g- great, great answer. I love Fade Rautha. Uh, we talked about Dune on the Doofcast last week. Um, yeah. Both really liked the movie and totally agree with you about Butler. I also thought he was just a Skarsgård. Just... <laughs> Yeah. emulating his father this is great it's great i saw the movie again since we did that podcast by the way and i loved it even more um so yeah good performance yeah uh spadoinkle 79 says my favorite overgrown creepy possibly haunted house is the mayfair mansion it probably has a name but it's been a long time since i've read the series in Anne rice's mayfair trilogy it is a house that is definitely haunted but only a select few hand-selected people know about the spirit that haunts it Everyone else just stays away because of that weird feeling you get that something is wrong with the place or has accidents, et cetera, around or in the house. It isn't actually even the house that makes it my favorite. It is the description of the house in New Orleans neighborhood that does it for me. Reading this story makes me want to see the garden district where it's located in New Orleans as a whole, which I never have. If you're going to read The Witching Hour because of this comment, stop there. The next two books are terrible. <laughs> um then my favorite side piece monster is the fire hose in The Shining. The idea of an in- inanimate object trying to attack you is scary enough, but the scene, for whatever reason, especially in the book, has always scared the shit out of me. I don't know uh-huh. why and do not have to explain my reasons to you. Nope, you don't. <laughs> it's terrifying. Uh-huh. It's terrifying. I totally agree. Yeah, it's great. I've never read a single word of Anne Rice, and I feel like I have to at some point. Yeah, we should put one on the book club. I mean, I I, I love Interview with a Vampire, the the film. Obviously, I've, yeah. I've never read it. Though. I guess I guess that's a good question for the audience. Those of you that have read Anne Rice, like, is there one? Is there if if we were like to read one Anne Rice book, is Interview with the Vampire just like the one, or is there another another one that's a, a better better example of Anne Rice? Let us know. Good question. Rob the Gob says, so I have one answer for both questions. Damn you, Rob. My answer, of course, is the Dutch Hill House in the Wastelands. From the outside, the house is your classic abandoned and possibly haunted house that is the stuff of legend in the neighborhood. The description of the house is legitimately unsettling, and thanks to seeing it through Jake's and Eddie's eyes, we, the reader, feel even more unsettled at how not right the house feels to the boys in the cotet. But driven by the need to cure his insanity, Jake enters the horrifying house and finds it's not just a house, but a monster in the form of a house. The way the king writes the transformation of the house to a monster trying to kill Jake is so vivid and adrenaline pumping. Uh, they also said, not a main villain or monster in the Dark Tower, but an unforgettable one. Jake's part of that sequence is one of my favorite parts in the whole series. Oh, so what Rob has done here uh, is, I read that wrong. He he gave one answer, uh-huh. Matt. So I forgive him for everything. He just uh-huh. applied it to both questions. That's brilliant. You win. Yeah. We don't have to read anymore. Yep. Rob has won that's, the prize. That's this is actually the answer we were looking for. You've solved the, the riddle. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's great. Very funny. Uh Gravis Tun says, My favorite haunted setting in fiction is by far the apartment above the c- convenience store in fire walk with me everything about the characters and setting in the scene are memorable dis- memorably disturbing in a realistic realistically surrealistic way i like that I like that phrasing my favorite side monster would have to be the woodsman in twin peaks the return scene with matthew lillard in the back of the patrol car the scene absolutely exploded with dread and horror as it unfolds and created some visuals that will stick with me forever are we a uh are we a David Lynch fan? <laughs> I think yeah, so. Looks like I it. Is this so. is this the first Lynch reference? Because Lynch is really good at at creepy environments and creatures. It is the first Lynch reference. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We have a jerk stab worthy who says the first answer I have might may be controversial. Ooh, but only if you're an incel movie <laughs> nerd who needs to get a life. <laughs> <laughs> Aliens is a horror movie set in space. The best overgrown haunted house is the millennial millennia derelict engineer shipwreck on lv 426 the architecture is so alien that you immediately have a feeling of unease and dread as dallas lambert and kane enter to investigate the giant dead engineer pilot corpse and cargo hold cargo hold full of disgusting slimy xenomorph eggs are icing on the creepy cake that lead to the greatest series of jump scares ever wait why is that controversial (laughs) just because it's not technically a house 
um maybe maybe because um like we have all this other context about it uh, I, I don't know. I don't find I don't it know. controversial. I, jerks out. I, I don't feel like that's controversial at all. I'm with you. Yeah. Maybe it's because I'm not a, I, I guess I'm officially not an incel movie nerd who needs I to get guess. a life. That's unfortunate. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but I'm not one. I'm oh. saying. Okay. Why did you just assume, <laughs> Matt? <laughs> uh, uh, as for my favorite side piece monster, I really tried to think of a non Stephen King answer, but honestly, there are too many in the Dark Tower books alone for me not to have one on the top spot. My favorite has to be Dandolo. He's such a grotesque, evil, insidious monster, made all the more upsetting by his glamour during the protagonist's first meeting. He offered everything Roland Sue's and Oi need needed after all their loss and misery just to snatch it away. That's a good yeah. answer, too. Like it. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I never quite thought of it that way as being like offering everything they needed um mm-hmm. and and that being such a relief to them and then ripping it away and making everything even worse yeah that's great uh the phrase uh sorry pear jane says the phrase side piece monster is killing me why why would anyone cheat on their partner monster that way (laughs) in any case i have such a hard time answering this because as we all know i'm a huge buffy fan so every week there's a new side monster i want to give big ups to the jurassic park t-rex who spends a good portion of the movie scaring the pants off us literally for certain lawyers (laughs) and then somehow becomes the hero of the story in the end um, as for the overgrown haunted house, I'm calling out the Usher house in What Moves the Dead by T. Kingfisher. If you're not familiar with the subgenre of sporer, consider yourself warned, colon, mushrooms, shudder. Well, I have a guess as to what sporer is after that, after that clue. <laughs> what do you think it means, man? I think it means horror involving mushrooms. Yeah, it's spore, spore horror. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I is apparently a real genre. I mean, I guess, I guess fungus is can be kind of gross and, and slimy. So sure. I mean, after uh, The Last of Us, read these seven sporer novels. I see. I get it. Yeah, it's that would that would fit. Yeah. Man, I feel like I've just been spoiled on on some of these books because I open the, this up and Mexican Gothic is on the list, and I'm like. Huh. not really? what i thought that book was about i guess maybe if there's like any element of like decay and rot then it becomes sporer i guess the the, the, the jurassic park t-rex though it's um can move totally silently when it needs to that's that's so like, good so it makes it really scary it also can make um a a level uh field of dirt turn into a giant cliff that's true it has, it's just a really remarkable animal it is. I love it. Uh, Hobo Demon says, favorite side peep monster has got to be the Sharkigator from Annihilation. Take a beast that evolution left physically unchanged for 100 million years because it's the perfect killing machine. A half ton of cold-blooded f- fury, the bite force of 20,000 newtons, and stomach acid so strong it can dissolve bones and hoofs. Now melt it flesh-wise with a shark so it can replace teeth indefinitely and go without air for life instead of mere hours. And you've jumped to a new Peridot point on the frontier of apex predators unattained by selective pressures as mild as the KT extinction. Sure. The main monsters of that damned bear and humanoid avatar of inevitable change are more horrifying, but maybe deep down I'm afraid of any ambush predator that can just lay there like a log with lifeless black eyes, like a doll's eyes (laughs) such that it doesn't seem to be living until it bites you. And those black eyes roll over white. (laughs) And then you hear that terrible high-pitched screaming. The bayou turns red. And in spite of all the pounding and hollering, those shark teeth have gone all the way down its throat like a sea turtle, all to come up on you and rip you to pieces. (laughs) Really gave swamp puppies a bad rap, that scene. Alligators, indeed, don't really seek people out as prey, except when they've gotten really big and learned that humans are easy to take down. But they're totally capable of being trained without ever becoming fully tame. Sort of like clad a panthera in that way it's the crocodiles that aren't specialized in piscovorism that really go out of their way to eat humans i love everything about this answer it's it's got so much to it it's got it's, jaws references yeah. it's talking about annihilation a movie i love it, it it's that's great I, I love that i mean i never really thought about the idea of using like the two perfect predators of nature <laughs> the the crocodilian and the, and the shark um into one animal and like how terrifying that would be. Um, like, yeah, totally. 
that's a great that's a great thought i mean and, and again like that, that there's something primal something primally scary about about alligators and crocodiles and crocodiles oh, yeah, in man. general they're they, scary yeah we've we've been scared of them forever they, they've they've been scary since before they were mammals so it's baked <laughs> in pretty deep yeah yeah uh teen bug doc says my favorite side piece monsters come from all the godzilla movies toho versions primarily while gojira always gets the top bill his main antagonist in every fil- film has plenty of discru- destruction in its store for humanity my personal favorites are king uh Ghidorah, Distro Distroroya, Space Godzilla, Radon, 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 Radon. We've been there over this. Yeah. And and all the Mecha Godzillas. The new Monsterverse creatures are fun, and I will always love the Toho classics. For creepy haunted houses, I will have to go with Exham Priori from Lovecraft's The Rats in the Walls. For anyone that has heard creepy rustling sounds in an old house at night, this one is perfect. The story is liberally salted with murder, madness, and cannibalism, and the ancient house sits atop a vast collection of evil. You have to think that King's fascination with rats in his er earlier work was at least inspired a little by this tale. Um, Yes, The Rats in the Walls is not too long. Uh, It's one of the only Lovecraft things I've actually read. It's super creepy. I love that. I haven't, I haven't really watched that much Godzilla though. So I haven't either. Um, I, there's a new Godzilla movie coming out in two days and I have absolutely no excitement about it, which is weird. Cause like I loved, I loved my beat strong. I liked the 2019 Godzilla reboot. Um, I liked the, I, I liked the Kong skull Island one. I liked that. Uh huh. Um, and then I kind of lost interest with them. Like Godzilla versus Kong did absolutely nothing for me. Yeah, it was just silly. And now we've got Godzilla X Kong because see, they're not they're not fighting anymore. Yeah, they're they got, they're, they're buddies. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's I I didn't hate it. It's just silly. It's kind of fun. Yeah. Although they're everyone's talking about Godzilla minus one, which is the one that came out last year uh which is the, the japanese it, it's the jap like not the americanized version but just a, a japanese studio that released this movie that is is apparently very very good and i still haven't seen it um i feel like i need to see that yeah i've heard a lot of compelling good stuff about that it won the academy award for best uh, special effects wow even though it had a budget <laughs> of very very low Holy crap compared Seriously? wow yeah okay yeah. i need to check it out mm-hmm uh, all right. Last but not least, we have Canis Puride. Py- how, how would you say that? Canis Puride. Puride? Puride? That's what we're going with. Okay. <laughs> Best side monster for me was the spider creatures in the mist. Not sure if Matt has read that one, so I don't want to get spoilery. But when they start to attack, it's one of the creepiest things I've ever read. Uh, you have not read the mist, right, Matt? But we watched Correct. the movie. Yeah, I mean, there's spider creatures in the movie, but maybe they're not quite the same. Mm-hmm. As for the best overgrown haunted house, I have to give it to Shirley Jackson and Hill House. Just the opening description of the place and the line, whatever walked there, walked alone, is amazing. I agree with that. And uh, I love that that book, and I love Mike Flanagan's adaptation of that. And I hope to be able to talk about them one day. Excellent. All right, that is it. That's all of them, right? Yeah, no. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank a Special thanks to Hobo Demon for being the only one on this list who only answered one of the two questions Uh uh-huh you actually get the prize we have to take it away from uh rob rob answered one for both but hobo demon actually just answered one so (laughs) you win we don't make the rules oh yeah we we do actually (laughs) it's that thing where like you know do you ever have a teacher do that thing where like they're like read the directions very very carefully and then like direction four is like uh, write your name and then turn the quiz in yes scott yeah blank. i did i did have the teacher do that scott yes it's like we were doing that with y'all and you you fell yeah. failed that's a bullshit thing to do i just like that's that's a dumb i that's a dumb activity i would always fail that assignment <laughs> always yeah because you don't read the instructions you yeah. read the questions because they're I'm, right there i'm just trying to get to work i'm just trying <laughs> to st- stop fucking with me and let me do anyway it's it's fine well matt you need to learn to follow instructions that's the lesson yeah well i guess so 
I'm bad at following instructions. Well, gee, I thought I was just here to learn math. Yeah. 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 Sorry to dig up old wounds. <laughs> All right. uh, Next week, we will not have a discussion question because it is the overview episode, but we will therefore have a mailbag. So let us know what questions do you have? Questions about Duma Key, questions about King in general. And of course, we love just, you know, sometimes having just the random grab bag questions about whatever. Uh, Send them in, please. Write them on Reddit. Send them in via email uh, because Kim will be on the show. You can feel free if you want to ask Kim any questions either. Uh, We will make sure she, she, she sees those prior to the recording. And uh, and we'll we'll talk about them on the show. So yeah, send in those mailbag questions. We love them. Yeah, excited, excited about mm-hmm. the mailbag. Yep. All right, that's going to do it for us this week. As we said, overview episode next week. Send in the questions. I'm going to repeat it again because that's the way. It's the way it works. Send in your questions, Matt. Where can they send the questions to? They can send those questions to the, our email at kingslingerspod.gmail.com. Uh, over on Twitter at KingslingersPod, or of course over on the subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash doofmedia. That's probably the best way to do it because then everybody can see them and comment on them and, and just have all sorts of delightful interactions. How many episodes into a show before you no longer have to tell people to subscribe to the podcast anymore? It's this this many, actually. I looked it up. Is it? Oh, it's uh, however good. many this number of episodes is. Uh, this will be episode 222. That's that seems cosmically significant. So <laughs> that's a lot of episodes. I think we're done. I think that was it. We're done with that <laughs> part of the, the outro. Have we really done? I mean, that I think that includes like one off things and bonus episodes. But still, still, fuck, S- still, <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot. Yeah, I'm just going to we're just going to delete this part yeah, out of the script. It's yeah. done. And, yeah. and the, in, in 222 more episodes, we can delete the Patreon call out, which is... No, we can never pro- do that because that's money. But a- after 444 episodes, you don't think that'll be like enough of those? No? Yeah. Okay. No, you're fine. right. right. <laughs> <laughs> Patreon.com slash doof media, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Only 221 to go. Yeah. <laughs> and after 666 episodes, uh, we, of course, pledge ourselves to our Lord... <laughs> Satan. <laughs> if you cannot afford to uh subscribe on patreon right now that is absolutely okay you can of course help us out by sharing this podcast and as always by leaving us ratings and reviews this week's review comes from dan v over on audible who says best podcast ever end of story period exclamation point I've been wow. listening and reading along nonstop since July of 23, and I have finally caught up. My only King novel experiences prior to listening to Kingslingers were Fairy Tale and The Gunslinger. I can't say enough about how much I've enjoyed my journey and beyond. Wow, that's awesome. Uh, we don't get too many of those, Matt, that are uh, kind of doing the you of this whole thing and truly being fresh on on Stephen King. So that's that's awesome. Uh, it's great to hear. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely delightful. Cool. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Dan, and thank you to everyone who sends in those rating and reviews. Uh, and sorry to everyone that I offended with my six 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 joke. <laughs> sorry about that's, that. That's okay, Scott. I think they'll forgive me. I think so. You know who will forgive me? Who? <laughs> my lord, my lord Satan. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought forgiveness wasn't really, you know, his thing. I guess that's true. I guess. All right, folks, that's it for us. We'll see you back here next week for our last, our last stop in, uh, in Duma Key before we move on. <laughs> Long days and pleasant nights. And may you have twice the number. <laughs> <laughs>